What is up there everyone? Welcome here to another episode of Dynamic Conversations. The podcast where I chat with some very smart and interesting close friends of mine about a variety of different topics. In this episode here, I had the pleasure to sit down with my dear friend Benedicte, who is a incredible vegan cook and as well the founder of the Vegan Pop-Up Cafe, which is the first and only vegan truck in Norway. A couple of things that we will talk about here in this episode is advice that we would give both to beginning entrepreneurs, but also how to stay motivated as an entrepreneur, as you are basically the engine, the driving force when you're self-employed. And it is not always easy to be that, right? Especially during times as COVID-19, for example. Uh, but then we also talk about losing someone as it's something that we've both, an experience that we've both had in life. Benedicte has lost her brother, I've lost my dad. And we talk about that experience and the lessons that we've learned from that experience. But as this podcast goes, it is dynamic. Uh, we also talk about open relationships, um, inner demons and how to deal with them, taking advice and a very interesting calendar called the 4K Weeks Poster, where you basically check a box every four weeks, uh, a box of your life. Uh, so you have an overview of how many more years you have in your life. Now, as always, in the show notes, which can be found in the description of this episode, you can find all the resources that we talked about, uh, all the people that were mentioned, uh, all the websites, etc. Also, if you want to connect with Benedicte and uh, check her out, you can find her Instagram and Facebook and as well her website. So... All that can be found in the show notes. With that, please enjoy this dynamic conversation between Benedicte Collingsness and me. And I know, I hope I didn't um, mess up her last name. That's kind of like the thing in Europe <laughs> and different, having friends in different European countries. Last names uh, can be tricky, but to make sure that it is correct, let me just let Benedicte pronounce her own last name. Hello. All right, so my name is kind of tricky even in Norwegian, but uh, it's basically how you write it. It's Koldingsnes. Koldingsnes. I can try I can try. <laughs> so there you go. Enjoy this conversation between Benedicte Koldingsnes and me. From the topics that you picked and that I picked, yeah. is yeah. there, how do you feel called? Do you want me to start with one first or do you, would, would you like to start first? It's however you want. Well, this is your podcast. So I'm just thinking uh, you do whatever and then I'll... Uh, <laughs> it's fine. Right? Like yeah. if you feel yeah. called, like you want to ask uh, the first one, then go ahead. Mm. No, I mean, um, I sent you a picture. You did? Uh, Yes. And did you have a look at it? I did. So I can, if you want to talk about this, um, I can um, airdrop it here in this conversation. So anyone watching can also see what we're talking about it or right. what we're talking about. Yeah. I so it, I, it was basically, it's basically a screenshot of an ad that I came up on my Instagram, I think. Either that or Facebook, it doesn't matter. Basically, it's a poster. Mm -hmm. that you can buy and it is like you know when you when you uh look at soccer games and you tick off like you know if it's going to be a win or a, a lose or you know even or whatever mm -hmm. so all these little boxes significa um symbolizes uh, one week in your life one week okay right so in this poster you basically have x amount of weeks of course, you know, I think they have like an average of 88 or 80 years. Yeah. So to just, they have 88 years and 100 years. Yeah. You can choose between those. Yeah. So of course, then you just kind of scribble every week you're alive and then you scribble this, the box. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the way they kind of uh, argued for why you should buy this poster is so that you would stop, you know, pronounce 
procrastinating yep. and be more efficient and God knows, you know, what they said this poster would, would do. And in the, when I first saw the poster, I'm like, yay, I'm going to get one of those, you know, it's such an intriguing thing. Um, but then I started thinking about it and I'm like, do I really want to have it that graphic in my mind or like mm. visually in front of me in the kitchen every time I go in there that, you know, now you only have this many, you know, weeks left. Now you only have this amount of weeks left. I think for me, it would be super stressful to have yep. it like that visually, but the clock is definitely ticking. I mean, it, it started ticking the day I was born, mm -hmm. but still, I mean, do you, people really need to be reminded that visually that, you know, the time is on and I don't know, maybe, I don't know. How would, what do you think it would trigger you? I uh, have heard something similar of someone doing something similar, but just having on their, on his watch, um, like X amount of years sets and then a, a timer, like going back, so like the minutes are like counting off of his life. Yeah. Uh, and this is another way then, right? Through a calendar. Yeah. Um, at first I was like, oh, wow, that's interesting. Mm. But then also the same, like how you're describing it now. I think I would become very anxious yeah. in a way. I, al I already feel like I'm quite not wasting time. I'm already like quite um, productive and trying to live my life as much as I can. So I think this will only more stress me out by having this too much in my face. Mm. But that's me. I think for some people, this could definitely be a motivator of yeah. not wasting time and trying to optimize and do more with their life. Mm. Um, but I find it interesting. Yeah. I would also find it interesting to actually buy it and try it out for a year, for example, hmm. to see what yeah. it would do. Yeah. Yeah. I think it just would, I think it would just, yeah, it would add a lot of pressure mm -hmm. uh, onto, I think it would just add another layer of pressure and stress on me as, you know, the way I already live, I think, because mm -hmm. I mean, I know that, you know, far back in my mind, I, I know about this, you know, I, I, because, you know, I don't really like getting older. And whenever I do, um, you know, wait with something or something, I, I get, I feel a little bit bad. Like I, I know I should really, uh, you know, use my time as efficient as possible, but without mm -hmm. you know, being stressed out about it. Yep. So it's just, I don't know. And it was just so, it really triggered something in me that I didn't like in a way. It was just like, I don't know. It's like your time is soon up, you know, it's just, I don't know. It was just because I, I don't, I don't want to die. I mean, nobody wants to die in like, you don't want to know. I mean, of course this, this poster is not going to tell you when you're going to die. I mean, you can die tomorrow, obviously, but mm -hmm. still it was just, um, I don't know. Maybe it can trigger like some sort of, I don't know, anxiety or depression in people that we know <laughs> this already, you know, but you know, when it's there and, and it's there I, you. I also think that life is not only about like being productive either no. and like always trying to optimize your time. Cause then life can feel like very much like a structure. And yeah. I do feel the same. Maybe, maybe this is a sort of what you didn't like about it. Cause I do feel like with this too, that life just becomes a box of things to check off. And I already have like to-do lists where I check things off. I don't need another thing to check off. And I feel yeah. like this could actually do that where, yeah, I would not, I would focus less on the enjoyment of life and more on the productivity yeah. of life. And with that, yeah. you can always be productive because <laughs> that's, exactly. that's stressful and not always fun. So, yeah, I don't think I would buy it. <laughs> no that's my conclusion as well like very intrigued at first but then yeah. I'm like no <laughs> i'm not gonna get it <laughs> and i wonder how many people who would be interested in buying this actually because i think most people would have the same like first like oh interesting and then they think about it and they are like hmm would i really want to have that in my room <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> like you wake up and it's like, boom, there. <laughs> yeah. It's like a ticking time bomb that you can see every day ticking away. Yeah. And again, I think maybe for some, it could be a good motivator, but I think for most, it's not really yeah. going to help, I think. No, I don't think so either. But I just, um, it was just interesting to observe like the, the, the kind of the, the process I went through when mm. I looked at it and I like was first so like, woo, and then like, no, just going from like really positive to like really negative. And it was just nice to kind of uh, see where my, my thoughts were taking me and the reactions it was creating in my body. And just like, uh, yeah, it was just interesting how it kind of triggered a lot of stuff, I think. Hmm. So why was it at the beginning first interesting for you? No, because, you know, I mean, I think, you know, I, because for, first of all, because I've, I've lost someone like my, my little brother and all that. So I yep. really know that life is about, you know, being grateful and really appreciating the small things in life and mm. uh, appreciate, you know, things that you have planned and also appreciate things that you haven't planned, you know, mm. and, and all those little things that kind of, you know, make life what it is, you know? Um, so it's, and so I'm very trying to focus on that very much in my life to be grateful for things and kind of focus on that, especially when I have like, you know, when I can just feel I'm going back into like the really dark black hole, I'm like, bah, 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 you know, and mm. trying to, to get myself back out of it by being grateful and, and thinking, you know, thinking positive and, and also be, knowing that, you know, my life will end one day. And I, I know that, mm. and, and I want to make the most of it. So when I just think of the positive aspects of being aware and knowing that our life is going to end one day, of course, it, it, it makes me, you know, really grateful. Like now, for instance, when my dog was, was, uh, was sick last week, I was so worried. Oh. I was crying. Yeah. I was like, oh, I was absolutely devastated because all of a sudden, boom, he was not the same dog that I, that I, that I've had for you know 10 years. All of a sudden mm. he was this weak little dog that couldn't move and he was in a, so much pain. And I was like, Oh my God, this is the beginning of the end kind of, of how, you know, our relationship has been me and, you know, because I take him everywhere. And all of a sudden now I have to carry him when we go hiking and stuff like that. So it's, all of a sudden it just became very real that my dog is, is getting older and, and now he was in a lot of pain. So thank God we, we, and I took him to the hospital and everything. So now he's, he's fine again. But just like that few days just made me really realize, mm. uh, shit, you know, this is, you know, this, he's getting old. And, you know, I, I mean, I always try to remind myself whenever I have him and I play around with him and I try always, you know, give him the absolute best life that I can. Mm -hmm. But it's just when you all of a sudden have this snapshot of what life will be now when it's getting older and all of a sudden, you know, it's not going to be there anymore. I just, just that thought in itself, it makes me cry, you know? Yeah. So it's just, so yeah, so it's just, um, I don't know, this, this poster just brought up all this stuff in me, I think. So wait, first of all, how is your dog right now? <laughs> so he's fine. Yeah. So um, the vet thought that he might have like a prolapse in his in his spine like in his sick cord so basically that means that how did that happen like, i don't know i mean i don't know but what she said is from the x-ray that the two vertebras like in the middle of his back were pretty close to each other mm -hmm. so that might uh, uh maybe that had create like created some sort of tension or like inflammation or something Mm. so because he would like walk on the you know floor just normal and then all of a sudden ow he would scream and i was like what you know nothing happened because sometimes he gets his claw like you know attached to the carpet or something and then it you know it, it thinks it's painful of course <laughs> but this was like nothing like that so um so but i don't know if it, if it is a prolapse but at least now he's fine so now he's back to normal so i'm like oh i feel like i i kind of got him back a little bit you know that's nice that is really nice. So this is kind of our dog here, like our family dog, right? Just turned uh, 10 years old too, uh, like mm. a, a few weeks ago. Mm. Um, but I didn't want to talk. About, well, I think you and I think I as well have had the experience of being reminded of the 
Well, how fast life can pass by, like with you, with your brother, with me, with my dad, then um, quite at an early age that you, both, that you had that experience, right? Yeah. And this was actually a topic that I wanted to bring up uh, okay. as a question. So I don't know if I want to dig into it now. <laughs> Um, but, um, what did I want to say here on, uh, oh, yeah, okay. But it definitely serves as, um, as a reminder of like that life can pass by very quickly. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I think maybe for some people, that's why I thought maybe for some people, this could be helpful when they didn't have that experience like this calendar, right. That it yeah. could also do that to show that life, you know, goes takes away. Uh, mm. But I don't know if for you and for me, because we had that experience already, it's yeah. going to be a helpful because we already learned that it is like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I get you actually with this calendar. I thought it was interesting. <laughs> I think it's, I'm, I'm actually very curious to show this to some other friends of mine to see mm. what they're, uh, thinking on this and even for people like listening I would be actually curious what they're thinking um, yeah. yeah I'm actually very curious to ask some other friends okay. sweet <laughs> have you shared it with anyone else yes I t today because I was uh, visiting an old uh, beloved old uh, neighbor of mine she's turned 80 oh god 80 <laughs> Or or something. Yeah, she's 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 past eighty anyway. If she would buy the calendar, eighty-eight yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's no, no. okay. <laughs> so I, I told her today, and I, I and I said this was going to be one of the topics that I wanted to mm. talk about, and she immediately said, "I would never buy that calendar." Okay. I mean, because she knows that she only has like you know a few more brackets or kind of you know uh, what can I say uh, rows to to fill out obviously yep. um so so she was like no it would just make me depressed and i'm like yeah i mean me too you know um because she also said that she doesn't want to know kind of mm. i mean not that this calendar is telling you you know you're gonna die you know in, in three years but it is still because it's so graphic and it's so visual you you, you feel that once you've ticked all the boxes what are you going to do then? You know, <laughs> I mean, yeah. if you, I mean, yeah, it's just, so she would not buy this either. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm really curious to ask some more people. Yeah. Uh, but I do, I could, I could see most would not want to buy this. Yeah. Like, yes. Yeah. Again, like I said, I think it will become more of a thing that you're just checking off another box yeah. of something that you don't want to check off in a way. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking as well. I mean, you want to, but then also you don't want to because you don't, because then you're basically telling yourself, all right, so, <laughs> I, you know, I like, I mean, we can never turn back time anyway, so. Another day closer to death, all right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Hip hooray. You don't really want to think about that every day. I mean, that yeah. is stressful, you know, it's just, uh, yeah, I don't think it's, I really don't think it's, it's healthy either. Like, you know, it's, um, yeah. Yeah. So, no. yeah. All right. Um, well, unless you want to share something more on this, of course. No, I, I think it's fine. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Let me ask you, uh, one of the things that I had. Okay. Um, and first, because this is a question before I actually realize the actual question that I want to ask. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, you need some more wife for that. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to have to Let me actually. All the way up. <laughs> me do the same. What? <laughs> this is not the heavy question or the heavy, like the more personal question, I would say. Um, so we met each other not too long ago in, in like maybe like four months ago in Bali, four or five, I think something like that. Um, but I am surprised that I didn't ask you this question and maybe I did. And if I did, I'm so sorry that I'm asking it again and I feel like I forgot it, but I don't think I asked it first. So like you have, you know, you're a cook, you're a chef with, you know, vegan foods. How did you start with that? Like what, got you 
started into doing that? Mm. All right. So <laughs> well, that's a very good question in terms because it's, it's actually quite a, it's been a process. It wasn't something that I just kind of like, yeah, I'm going to become a vegan chef. You know, mm. it's definitely not something that I discovered overnight. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I can say that, you know, I've always been interested in healthy, eating healthy. So that's been like my, like a kind of background thing. And then I have my education from hospitality. So I already have like as a, you know, from, you know, when I started my career, I already have had like the interest for food and also the hospitality industry as it, as it is, you know. Um, but then, you know, I started a health coaching education or training. Um, when was that? Six, seven years ago or something? Yep. And, um, and then I, uh, so I started working as a health coach. Um, so then I had like clients one-to-one -one and I was like, oh, you know, I really liked it because, you know, we were talking about holistic health. So we were talking about not, not only about food, but also like, you know, all the other things that affect our mm. health. So, it was so the mind health. and the body kind of. Yeah. So it was like, you know, how much they work out and how they feel, you know, in their private life, you know, with the relationships with, you know, partner or whatever and how they are at work and, and of course food and, and all sorts of stuff, you know, that comes into it. Mm. You know, really enjoy that. Um, and at the time, I think I was vegetarian. So I'd already kind of, you know, started eating more green, more plant-based myself. And I, it, I really enjoyed uh, how it made me feel. Um, so, um, so uh, and then I was realized, all right, I really want to do this more. But I didn't really know at the time how I was going to get more clients. Because I realized I'm not making enough money just doing one-to-one -one clients. And this... Uh, so I was thinking of doing an online course. I wish I knew you then. You could have helped me, <laughs> but I didn't. So I was like struggling big time with creating an online course. And I, I didn't believe in myself enough for whatever reason. So it was kind of like, it was kind of just drifting away. I just didn't believe that I would, I would have something constructive enough to say for people to buy or whatever. Some, you know, you know, that normal demon way of thinking that you're not good enough. Yeah. It's always helpful, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so then I'm like, all right, so I need to do, I need to meet bigger crowds um, to spread the word that I'm actually doing this and maybe then getting, um, getting more clients in that sense. So I was like, all right, so I'm going to be a health coach and I'm going to go to bigger crowds. Like what kind of crowds is that? Like, how do I, where, what kind of crowds do I want to go to? And then I was thinking, all right, so if I go to like big fairs and festivals and stuff like that, then I, at least then I know I, I can be there. I can present myself and my service um, to more people. So then, you know, they get to know me. So then I was thinking, all right, so how do I want to present myself? Do I just want to have like a table and some pamphlet that I'm going to give out or, you know, that and a roll up? I mean, I'm just thinking, no, immediately. That's not me. So I'm not going to do that. It's way too boring. I want to do something more interesting than that. So then I was thinking, all right, so maybe I should bring some food, some samples that I, you know, you know, show them what I think, you know, what I would encourage them to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I was thinking, okay, so I'm going to go to festivals and fairs and I'm going to bring some food. Or maybe, and then I thought, maybe I should do like a food demo or something. That would be good. So I was like, right. So then I need some cooking equipment. And I need to make some food and I'm going to transfer this around from festival to festival. And I'm like, how, um, I need a car for that. Like, should I get one of those caravans? I was like, hmm, was thinking, you know, trying to figure out how I was going to transport these things. And then I think just somewhere along, you know, that line, I was like, oh my God, I need food. I'm going to transport it around and I'm going to be at festival. So I'm like, oh my God, I need a food truck, you know? Mm. So that's how I, the food truck came into the, the picture. And then I was like, shit, who's going to do the cooking? And I'm like, oh my God, it has to be me. <laughs> you know? So then I was like, oh my God, did I just turn into a chef? <laughs> so it kind of like, I forced myself into that position and into that kind of job without really realizing it and without really wanting it at, at such. But I was like, well, this is really what I want people to do because I want people to look after themselves more. Mm. I know one of the one of the things you can do, obviously, is with your diet. Mm -hmm. so I was definitely on the path that I had chosen, which was health coaching. But all of a sudden, it just kind of like, you know, went into 
food. And, and, um, and then I became vegan myself. So when I created the final concept for the truck, uh, because first it was going to be healthy veg vegetarian food. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, I went vegan myself and then I'm like, oh, I'm just going to go all in and just do healthy vegan food uh, instead, not only vegetarian. So that's really how it kind of started. And it just, uh, yeah, it's just been crazy after that because I freak out when I get like caterings, I have to make food for like five, 50 people, you know, like five or four dishes. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, and I need, you know, the big kitchen and all sorts of stuff. So I just had to learn this like, woo, really, really quickly. Damn. That's so mm. cool. <laughs> yeah. That's how, how, started. how long do you feel like you know what you're, doing like how long do you feel like the food truck and that concept and all that is actually being a thing what do you mean like wh what are you asking like the food truck what you're doing yeah. right now right and the chef yeah. part and doing that all how long mm -hmm. has that actually been like how long have you been doing that oh, actually this is my fourth year so okay fourth four year. years yeah. that you've been doing that okay yeah yeah wow so it's pretty crazy. So in the beginning, I had other like proper chefs because I never called myself a chef because, you know, I, I've never been to like cooking school for like years, you know. So I, I did one training in Palma uh, last year. Mm -hmm. um, so in the beginning when I, I, I kind of freaked out a little bit because I, I didn't feel that I was good enough, of course. Um, like you always do when you embark on something new. Um, so then I had some other chefs that made the cook the food for me because I was like, guys, I need like 20 liters of stew or like soup or whatever. And I had, had never cooked more than, you know, food for like four people at the most. Um, so I, in the beginning I was like, okay, guys, can you help me? Can you cook, you know, whatever meals? And they were like, sure. But then one of the, one day, one of the chefs came up to me and he goes, Hey, I'm happy to help you, but you have to realize that I'm basically taking all your money because you're not making any money now because mm. you're paying me to make the food for you. So you have to do this yourself. And I was like, really? And he goes, yeah. I mean, if you want to survive and if you actually want to make money on this, you have to start cooking this stuff yourself. And I was like, oh, really? And he goes, yeah. And I'm like, okay, fine. So after that, I started slowly doing it myself and I you know, build more confidence as well. And that's also why I decided to go to that cooking school because I really just, I basically did it for me because I needed to feel more confident and, mm. you know, kind of boosting myself a little bit more. So, uh, so yeah, so um, it's been a crazy ride and I've learned so much and it's, it's crazy. I can't believe I'm doing it actually, to be honest. And, uh, but I, I love it, you know, and the people love the food and it's, it's really, it's, it's a lot of fun. So, I mean, I've seen photos of your foods. And it looks amazing, right? And he, I mean, I probably when I'm editing this, I can show you some photos of your food because it looks amazing, but I'm so curious actually to try it at some point. Yeah, you should. <laughs> do you consider yourself now do, like a chef? Like would you say that you are? Um, I don't think I would ever say that I'm a chef as such because, because I know that- And sorry to interrupt, but like some people like the same, like calling themselves an artist. Some people yeah. really have trouble saying that, even though that they're an artist, even though that you are a chef, you're cooking. Like, yeah, I'm just curious, like why would you, or yeah. Yeah, no, it's basically out of respect for the chefs who have had like proper training in school and they have like papers that say that they're well, a chef. But the paper doesn't equal like the fact that you're a good chef, like I'm sure they have gone through a good training mm. and are able to cook great. Right. But I still think if you can make amazing foods that you're as equally without or with a paper able to call yeah. yourself a chef, that's me of course. Right. Yeah. I think it's more about what you do than, than what you learned like by like which school or like which whatever cooking school yeah. you know i think it's just yeah what you do yeah yeah and uh, you're definitely yeah, I mean, to me a chef actually yeah well thank you <laughs> but uh yeah no it's um it's just that i don't want to uh provoke anyone by saying it publicly or putting it on my website or something so i i say that i i cook that you're just food. a good 
that you're a good cook. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just saying that, you know, because I think it's also a difference. Maybe it's just the terminology, but I think there is a difference between being a chef and a cook. A okay. chef, yeah, I think you've had like proper formal training. And if you're a cook, you basically cook food. I mean, you do what the head chef tells you to do kind of thing. So I think that's, that's where the, um, the difference comes in. So I, so, and I don't want to trigger anyone. Uh, by saying I'm a chef when I'm not. So mm. it's also just to keeping my back clear in the sense that the, there is a lot of, um, uh, people are very proud of their profession and their uh, you know education. And you know I think they should be because it is yep. a hard job to be really good at this. Um, but what I do notice is though that even though I work with and I talk to a lot of professional chefs, they don't know how to cook vegan food. Right. So yeah. I know I'm better at doing that compared to them, but of course they would, you know, cook whatever else much better than me uh, because of their training. But when mm -hmm. it comes to this type of food, they are like, I don't know how to do it. You know, we, we were never taught this stuff. And I'm like, aha, right. <laughs> I can <tell> you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So, mm. I mean, I have done trainings for chefs. Yeah. Um, and, and I, the first, one of the first things I tell them is that, I'm not going to teach you how to cook because you know perfectly well how to cook food. I'm just going to show you how to cook this type of food because when you cook, when you make vegan dishes, you have to think the composition wise, you need to, need, you need to think a little bit differently okay. than what you would do if you make uh, dishes with meat. So that is, that is really the only thing I, I kind of give them like a little bit of inspiration to like how they then compose a dish instead of, um, you know, the traditional way. Yeah. How is it, uh, how is it so much different? Well, because you basically need, when you not when you, when you don't use the meat, you mm. then use something else that will give you the filling feeling. Mm. It will give you the same nutrients. Um, you know, and how do you combine the different textures and the different flavors? Um, because as we know, I mean, meat itself doesn't really, doesn't taste anything. I mean, the reason why people like meat is because it's seasoned and marinated and God knows with something with herbs and spices. So the trick is basically to do, I mean, use the lentils and use the beans that you might, you might do with chickpeas. You just treat them as they were meat. You, mm. you do the same seasoning, you, you cook it, you bake it, you fry it, you do whatever. Um, but it's hard for people that are not vegans to kind of realize this because they're not used to it, you know? So it's basically, um, it's just a beginning, beginner, yeah, new way of thinking. And then when, once you figure it out, you realize how easy it is, you know? Okay, I do feel like I didn't ask you this question of how you started. No, maybe not. No, I don't think I did. Um, no. But like I said in the beginning, it's only like we met each other for a couple of months, but still I'm surprised that I didn't ask, but I'm glad that I <laughs> got to know now because it's quite interesting actually. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. So the question that I, um, like the actual question uh, that I wanted to ask, uh, and I think like i don't know with like a last call that we had like um of just staying motivated as as you know being self employed i kind of wanted to ask you just um do you have any tips on how to stay motivated mm. for people and do you also have tips for people who are just at the start of being self employed and I filled a few tips in too that I can share so we can go back and forward here so we can mm. learn from each other too. Mm. Um, but that was the question actually of, uh, yeah, uh, how do you stay motivated and do you have any mm. tips as well for people starting out? Mm. Well, um, not in the field of a chef, right? Or a cook, right? But just no, no, as no. A, being self-employed. Yeah. Well, first, I think it's really important to, um, I mean, um, all right. So if, if they are self-employed, you know, they, they are self-employed for a reason. Mm -hmm. So they have hopefully found 
something that they are passionate passionate about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know that they, uh, you know, which is the main reason for why they're doing this. Yeah. So I think for me at least, when I am struggling with motivation, like now with the corona and and everything that has been going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have to say that my motivation just really kind of, woo, you know, went like really, I lost it almost completely. Um, so it's just that then you just have to ask yourself like the big question, basically, like, why are you doing this? You know, mm. why, why, why are you doing this? And it's just, oh, I want the freedom and I, oh, I want to make my own money. That's one thing. But it's not really that, you know, I mean, that is, of course, one of the main things, but you really have to go into the core of why you chose what you do. Yep. Because what I find is that many, not all, but many people that do work for themselves, they have found some sort of, uh, this, they are like almost value-based businesses, you know, they work with it because it brings them some sort of meaning or mm-hmm. some sort of value. They work from the heart, like, as we say. So. I think you just have to kind of roll back, you know, go all the way back into all the reasons and then find the core of why you're actually doing this, you know, and, and really remind yourself of that. Because uh, for me now, I'm like, you know, now I've kind of found my motivation again, but when I was feeling a little bit lost, I was like, oh, you know, because I have a a big vision, I have a big mission with what I do. So I was like, I, I don't know if I, I, I didn't ask myself this, but sometimes I'm like, are you, what, do you want to let down the animals? And I'm like, no, I don't want to let down the animals. You know, I want to, you know, because I'm, I feel like I speak, I use my voice for them mm-hmm. and I, that they, I, they will always have my voice. Mm-hmm. So if I kind of, you know, stop doing what I'm doing, then I feel like I let the animals down and I don't want to let them down. So that's why I kind of keep on doing what I'm doing. All right. That's one of the things that I had here too, (laughs) but I'm so happy. And you're actually one of the people for me that when I think of a person who does, you know, what they do and have a passion around it, then you're one of the people that I think of, because I really feel like you're very passionate about what you do. And that's why, like, and I think that's what we also were calling about, like some, some weeks ago or something that like there was someone asking me, uh, or, or saying that they wanted to be an entrepreneur or self-employed to have more free time. And mm. I was like, you are not going to have more free time when you do this. <laughs> no. Like it's the complete opposite. Yeah. If you want free time, you should totally go for a nine to five job. Yeah. And you know, that should not be the, the motivator of wanting to do that or wanting to be a digital nomad or those things. I would not recommend that to be the motivator for wanting to do something on your own, but instead yeah. do something that you want change, you know, where you want to see change in and where you feel a passion for, because in moments like COVID-19, like those really dark and difficult moments where you lose motivation, mm. wanting to be a digital nomad, that motivation is not going to help you get through it. Yeah. But no. the deep passion of what mm. you want to make changing, that, that is going to help you through it. Mm. And so for the long run, yeah, you've got to do something that you're passionate about. Yeah. Uh, it's all, it's not going to last. No, because there is, there is nobody else who's going to motivate you. I mean, you're, no. what I've realized is that as a self, you know, self-employed, my actually biggest job is to keep myself motivated. <laughs> because nobody is going to pull me out of the bed Nobody's going to tell me to do the accounting. Nobody's going to tell me anything. So I have to kind of do it all like is my, my, I'm going to be my own engine kind of, you know? And, and, um, yes, it's basically one of the most important things is to manage to keep yourself motivated because there will be struggles. God knows. I mean, Corona is one thing, but I mean, you have all sorts of other, you know, financial issues that you need to think of. And, you know, if you start employing people, I mean, ooh, you know, I, I know that some of my friends who are entrepreneurs and they have hire people and they say the worst thing they know about being the boss is the people that they need to manage or like they have to ma- manage because mm. once you put more people into the mix and they all have, of course, their, you know, individual lives and feelings and drama going on, you know, and you, all of a sudden you have to manage that and you kind of lose track of 
you know, when you first started out on your own, it was only you and you can do whatever, you know, you will work way too much and sleep way too little. And then all of a sudden you have like three people and they all of a sudden have some drama going on at home and their kid is sick. And all of a sudden you have all this like disturbance elements, I would say, when it comes to, you know, being productive and, and moving things forward. Yep. So they say that's like the worst to have actually people working for you. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's a nice thing to know because I've always thought, well, I mean, you know, I want to have people working well, for me. But then I'm thinking, oh, you know. But I guess it depends, right? Because I do have people working for me and I actually love that. I actually love to, to manage a team. Uh, I think it's very personal uh, I think you might like it too, because I know that you like to do like manage things and, and all that. So I think you might actually enjoy it. Hmm. Uh, it's not a responsibility, that's for sure. But uh, I actually <laughs> like it. But do you have them like full time employed? So I know, yeah. Them? So I have on a freelance base. So I send exactly. them, you know, ex yeah, yeah. So a it's a different, different kind of contract, right? Uh, than yeah. having a full time. Yeah. But still, like I am aiming this year to have part time someone uh, to employ yeah. someone part time, um, and I am not looking against it. Like I already had some experience now with a freelance contract, and and they also go through trouble. They also need some explanation, and I actually like yeah. I like that. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's personal uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, oh. it's just that no, my dog needs to go out, so I'm just gonna help. Oh him yeah, out. I just I wanted to say that Luke needs some yeah, attention. Yeah, he's barking at the door, going, "Let me out!" <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, just give me one moment because the sun is coming in. I mean, obviously, you know, living in Norway, the sun never goes down in summer. So I'm just gonna. Turn Don't worry. This. Yeah, I go. think this could be a good moment for me to quickly go to the toilet. And <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> All right, so we have a little, uh, a little session, timeout session. Yeah, sure. Go ahead if All you right. need to do something. Yeah, I'm just going to look after him, okay? Cool. <laughs> All right, we are back. <laughs> All right. Oh. Yep. Yeah, bye, I'm here. You're, you're gone again. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm here. It's just the sun is coming in my kitchen window now, so now I'm gonna be sitting here in the sun Can a little bit. Just quickly take a photo of me taking a photo of us. <laughs> That's weird. Anyway. Um, all right. So let me quickly, sh well, let me also share then one of the, the tips that I have of yeah. beginning people and also how to motivate. And I think this is such an essential thing that I think you will also find yourself in and that I kind of wish that I did earlier, but it's to find your, like a community of people mm -hmm. who are doing, who are also self-employed, who are doing like something creative or something, what you're doing, right? Because yeah. it is quite lonely in a way to start out. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes people don't understand what you're doing or, you know, it, so it's really helpful when you're surrounded with some people uh, that do get what you do. Uh, and like, you know, I remember that you said in Bali that this was sort of the first time that you were feeling surrounded with people yeah. that, yeah, where you felt like you had a community of people. Yeah. So I think, and that's one way, right? Like co-working place is a great way of finding a community. Uh, but then also something that I'm actually doing right now is, uh, so I have a personal YouTube channel. I wouldn't call myself a YouTuber or something, but it's like, I was actually looking for other Belgian YouTubers who also have a YouTube channel. And I actually reached out to a couple of, uh, of them and just asked like, Hey, I have a YouTube channel too. Uh, you have one too, could be fun to actually meet each other. And so I got, uh, so I wanted to, yeah, I reached out to YouTubers already, but I want to reach out to people who have a podcast in Belgium as well. Uh, that's like another way, right? To just reach out to people who are doing something that, that you're doing or that you're interested in and connect with them. Uh, mm. And uh, that's one other way. Um, 
and then just going to places where there's a chance of meeting more like-minded people like Bali, for example. Mm -hmm. If you just go to it, you have a high chance, a very, very high chance that you're going to run into some people who are also self-employed and uh, who are open-minded and just like that, right? So, but co-working place and reaching out to people like on the internet, Mm. wherever you are, you can do that. Uh, so I would actually do, yeah, I would actually, uh, recommend that just cause it can become really lonely in the beginning. And it certainly was for me. Um, it's better now cause I have more, uh, yeah, I have more friends now who also are self-employed like you, for example. And so it feels less lonely now, but yeah, damn, I, the couple, the first couple of years definitely weren't fun in that way. And uh, so, if I could recommend something, that would be that actually. Yeah. Uh, as a tip. Good advice. <laughs> I totally support you on that. <laughs> yeah, and I think you definitely can find yourself, from what I heard when you were talking, you know, um, mm-hmm. about this. That yeah. Yeah. You feel that too. Just finding, yeah, just finding vegan people in the city. You know, I've actually. It's funny that you mention it because. I came to the, uh, I've, you know, I've been thinking about this for uh, a little while. Like I would like to expand my friends here in Bergen uh, Mm -hmm. who are vegan because it's just so devastating to go into barbecue party after barbecue party. And I just see all this flesh and blood everywhere. And I just want to vomit, you know, and, I, I know that my friends don't think about it, but they put like the biggest plate of the freshly barbecued meat right in front of me. And only, and, and I'm like, Ooh, and I'm like, could you just, and I, I don't, I don't want to make a scene or anything. So I just lifted the, the plate and I just give it to yeah, I'm like, Hey, who wants pork chops, you know? Yeah. And I just kind of move the, the, the tray away or I physically remove myself out of the setting. Like when, the other day we were at the beach and my friend started barbecuing some sausages. And the barbecue was like the grill was right in front of my face. So I, I told him like, um, could you just move that barbecue a little bit? Because I'm getting that the, the smell in my face. And he goes, well, this is the only way I, we, I can put it. And I'm like, and it wasn't, but I was like, okay, fine. So I just basically took Ludwig and I was like, I'm just going to go for a little walk. So I just basically went away and obviously I wasn't going to eat anything anyway. Mm. So then I'm like, I feel um, so alone in that sense as well, because none of my friends really the ones that i hang out with the most anyway are vegetarian or vegan so mm. so then i made a little list actually <laughs> with people that i know now know in bergen that are vegan or vegetarian and it's like wow you know this list is actually getting bigger and bigger and i was right. like I, I, and then i thought i should just make my own little barbecue party and get this group of people together you know i and love so that exactly and, yeah so, uh, so now I have a list of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven people. All right, that's 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 a party. That's good. Yeah, it's definitely a party, and yeah, and they're all amazing people. So I'm like, I can't even wait to get these people together. <laughs> yeah, and th- and this is where like you shouldn't always wait, or you know, do if you can't find it right the barbecue where everyone is cooking vegan, like then just host it yourself. You know, that that's where you got to be the change that you want to be, what you want to see in the world. And it's just about just putting in the effort in. And uh, it's nice to see that you're actually doing that because that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, like I think also like uh, maybe you did this already, right? But just going on the internet and looking for Norwegian people who are vegetarian or something like that. Maybe not in Bergen, but just in Norway to already connect with some. Uh, there's yeah. quite more than you might think. And maybe f- looking on YouTube, like uh, I'm pretty sure there might be a YouTube channel of someone who is vegan too or something like that. Definitely. Or just Definitely. more similar thinking like you. And that could be people yeah. to reach out to quite easily. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah. I did actually this last week, I went to an animal sanctuary that opened here in Bergen last year. Uh, and I had the most amazing conversation and time there. And, mm. you know, I met the lady who runs the sanctuary. And of course we had all these things in common and I would like to run a sanctuary myself one day. So that's basically why I, I went there because I wanted to connect with her. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just such a nice experience. So she's on my list as well. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it's nice because definitely when I came back from Bali, I was like, I need to change something, you know, because the, the path that I'm on right now is not really taking me where I want to go in terms of, mm. you know, exploring and, and have a bigger crowd around me that is more like-minded, you know, to me. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely a good point to be the one who reaches out and actually yeah. make efforts, you know, exposing yourself and, and yeah. reaching out. And I think you more have to count on that on one, like on you being the person to reach out than them reaching out to you. Yeah. Else you could wait forever. Like you're yeah. literally like waiting for someone to knock on your door. Yeah. While, you know, just go and be the person yourself to knock on someone's, uh, mm-hmm. someone's door yourself. Like, I think that's yeah. more effective and you don't yeah. have to wait that long either. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. I think, I could recommend more people to do, and it's awesome to see that you're doing that too. Yeah, likewise. Do you have any other things, any other motivators, any other tips that you would say? I mean, what you already shared in mm. the first one was already a really great yeah. one. Um, no, I think that's basically the core. I think mm-hmm. that's like really the essence of uh, of what the important thing is. And of course, you know, um, yeah, I think, um, and I think also it's nice. It's important to celebrate each stage you're on in a way. Mm. You know, I think that's uh, it's an important thing because we are so focused on having progress and reaching, reaching, doing, 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 uh-huh. and it's sometimes it's just nice to kind of sit back and go like, "Wow, I actually achieved that!" You know, I actually did that. You know, and be proud of the product and the service that you offered and. And really take in the good feedback that you get from people, you know, mm. especially when you're feeling demotivated, you know, then you should really go back and look at the feedback from your customers or, you know, look at pictures where you were having a good time and you were really enjoying yourself and kind of like just kind of really um, give that good feeling some, so a new kind of breeze of like mm. good energy or whatever, you know, it's just like, it's really important to, to kind of go back and, and think, wow, I, I did that whole event or whatever, you know, um, and, and yeah, people loved it and uh, made me feel good. And just think about all the stuff that you have accomplished uh, along the way. Yeah. And I think personally for me, sometimes that's something that I should focus more on because hmm. I just like to also consume working on the next thing. Uh, but yeah. like you said, when you feel demotivated, it's such an awesome thing to go back and actually read those positive reviews or those positive comments or yeah, to go back to them because they can definitely help uh, to show that you're doing good and that you should just continue on. Uh, So that's a good way. Yeah. Mm. If I can like slide one more that I had here of tip uh, in this is that actually um, that it's going to take much longer than you think it is going to take. And I think a lot of people, you know, kind of delay or are like, yeah, it's just going to take one year for me to do this full time or they just don't have the right. They have like an inflated idea of how long it can actually take before you full time can do something self-employed yourself. Like, cause there's so many things that come with it. Right. Like it literally took for me, I would say like three years to fully get to the point of being able to do this full time. Mm. And it took three years of working every day on it. Like really, even the weekends, every day, it took a long time, Mm. but it's quite normal and it's quite fast actually in comparison to some other people. And I think, and mainly what I want to say with that is like, just don't delay. Like if, if there's something that you want to do, I would already start putting some, work in it because uh, it's only when you start doing that you will also start figuring out how much longer it's going to take yeah and i think that's really important uh and, and so that's what i would also actually say as a as a tip of like starting if people who want to start out like already mm-hmm. start now mm-hmm. yeah. you don't have to do it full time but just start putting some effort in it yeah. and you will realize like wow okay 
this is still going to take some time. Than what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, yeah. there's a hundred of things, right? There's hundreds of things. It's even like just the, the paperwork and all that kind of stuff that, that a lot of people don't even consider and mm. like paying taxes and all those things, like learning that takes time yeah. too. Mm. And, website and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I would also say. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you have something else that you want to add. To the, I mean, like we could talk a lot about, you know, uh, running your own business and stuff like that. But if it just comes to the motivation stuff inside of it. Uh, yeah. I think, we're, I think we've covered. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, yeah. Yeah. Motivation was. Yeah, I would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I would also. <laughs> I think I would because I don't. I don't know if it comes to with motivation or what. But sometimes it's um, is something about trying to make it as smooth and easy for yourself as possible. Like if you have the chance of doing something. Uh, I'm not saying cutting corners in a way, but sometimes you can either do everything yourself. Or you can get somebody else to do it for you and you have to pay them a little fee mm. because it is very overwhelming at times. I mean, we both know this. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you're going to do did, 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 all these things, but it, uh, sometimes you can just say, all right, these, this group of um, things that needs to be done, somebody else can do. Yeah, yeah. So it's just basically to kind of always try and, and stay in some sort of balance in terms of if you have the money, for heaven's sake, pay somebody to do the, the, yeah. that they can do it for you because that also is very draining on the motivation. If you see that I have so much work and I can never get through this, I cannot meet my deadline. And then you start stressing out. So then, you know, whenever you have the opportunity, I think you also told me this once, whenever you have the opportunity for heaven's sake, do it, you know, get somebody to do it for yep. you because it will make you, make you feel like you have more energy and you are more in control of the process yourself instead of being overwhelmed, you know? Yeah, it's like diversifying the work to not just let it all fall on you, right? If the, yeah, you have the financial yeah. capability to do, hire someone, then hire someone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah, it's also about not overcomplexifying sure. something uh, mm. and going always for like making things perfect, you know? Because yeah. not to say that you shouldn't aim to make it as good as possible, but uh, yeah, don't linger too long around making something perfect perfect because that's not a thing in mm. the end you can't make something perfect no but okay all right what is another topic that you have on your list and <laughs> how is how is the wine flowing for you <laughs> it's good it's good I'm, I'm halfway down so this is gonna be interesting <laughs> i'm actually quite thirsty today <laughs> Yeah, my I'm one bottle, glass ahead of you. <laughs> my, oh, damn. My, <laughs> well, my bottle is sort of halfway, um, but I did like the the small part, so. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. Now we're really getting into it. <laughs> Wait, but, I, but I feel like your bottle is like uh, less. How many li milliliters is it? Because mine is. 75. Oh, 75 damn. All right. Mine yeah. too. Okay. You are ahead of me. God yeah. damn it. <laughs> so, bottles up. <laughs> Bottoms up. <laughs> And now, actually, I'm, we're going to talk about you. So now you really actually need to buckle up. <laughs> All right. I don't know, you alcohol or you water? <laughs> yeah, like, what do I do now? No, All it's, right. um, no the next, curious. The, yes, no, I mean, the next topic is, is very, it's a wide one. And uh, we have talked about this before um, when we were in Bali. Um, but it's such a big topic and we didn't specifically talk about what I would like to talk about right now. So that's why I'm bringing it up mm -hmm. because um, we talked a lot about self-love when we met uh, in Bali with mm -hmm. our dear friend Edith. Yeah. Mm, yep. And, um, and what I, what I, um, I mean, and we can talk about this alone for hours, you know, mm -hmm. like w what is it, how do we do it and, and all that stuff. And we can definitely talk a little bit about that too. But my thing, what I am curious about to hear is that because whenever I hear about self-love, it's only from a female perspective. Mm. So it's only like, are we the only ones doing this? I mean, as humans, 
I mean, don't guys, I never hear guys talk about <laughs> they loving themselves, you know, being, you know, self care for men. So I was just thinking, is this really just a female concept? I mean, guys must surely do this too, like yes or no. And if you do, what would you do? And if you don't, why the hell not? You know? Yeah. So do you, do you guys even talk about self love? All right. Like I'm now just looking at. Of course, now you're answering, of course, on behalf of all men and the planet. <laughs> no, no. I, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Responsibility. No, no. Um, I'm just looking at my friends' rights and the conversations that I have with them. And yes, we do talk about it. But I don't think we use the direct word of like self-love. Um, I think more like self-care would be a word that we use more or like just taking care of yourself. That's, yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't remember too many times talking about like specifically like saying the word self-love to someone, but it's actually really nice that you're bringing this up because I feel like I should use it more. Um, and it's again not like we don't talk about it but i think we just use another vocabulary of like words to talk about that topic uh and but if i would if i would think like with my friends right they're quite open-minded people i would say they're very intelligent people very smart people they care about developing themselves so they're they want to talk about this but i do think for a majority of other guys that it is a very hard topic a very difficult one that they don't talk a lot about. Um, but so to say, do I talk about it? I do. Um, I talk about it with, with friends, yes. I, can you tell me the question again? So <laughs> you do. So the question, no, but the basically it's just, um, you know, I mean, do we live in a society where it's taboo for guys to talk about it in a way or, mm. but if you guys do talk about it amongst yourselves and maybe women are not present while you do it or something, but I mean, mm. we read about it in magazines and we have it like everywhere. I feel like on Instagram, of course, I follow a lot of female persons. So then of course, this is a thing that we talk about it with amongst ourselves. And when I meet my girlfriends and all that. So I'm just wondering if that is also a thing that you guys, like you just said that you do, and what would self-love or self-care look like for yep. a man? I can't <laughs> say for all men. I can say for me what it would look like. Uh, and before I answer that, I think the thing of like that you read in so many magazines, I do, I do think that it's more dominant of a topic. Like it's more there for women than for men, for sure. Like for sure. You don't read too much about it in a magazine for guys uh mm-hmm. maybe once in a while right but it's not 10 articles it's maybe like one every year or something right oh really oh wow maybe right i, I or that's mm-hmm. i don't read a lot of magazines or something but it's just not too many thing times a, a, a topic i think uh that that is as as frequent talked about as maybe with with women um but, but, but before you go on, why is that the case, you think? And I could be wrong, right? I could be wrong. It's just that I feel that, it, that, that, that it's like that. Uh, why? It, I think just um, it's, yeah, the emotion, emotions. It, it's still a thing that is harder for guys to talk about than for girls, which also equals that it's less talked about for guys than for girls. And why? I, I, I guess this is sort of like the image still, like the very old fashioned image of like guys should not talk about, like, you know, they should just suck it up and just, yeah, suppress their emotions kind of. And, and oh, wow. I, I guess that's still a major factor. Not to say that there aren't guys talking about this, right? Because there surely mm-hmm. are. There, mm. there definitely are. And there's definitely some role models of mine who talk about this, you know, but I think it's not the majority, and it's definitely the majority for women. I would, I would, I, I would say. Um, and to well, to answer like how I practice self love, the first thing that kind of came to me on how I practice self love is just 
by listening to what's going on in sites and also acting on it. I, like that's to me what I would say self-love is like listening to what's happening inside you and then also doing something about it. Like if you feel lonely, listening to that feeling, you know, accepting that it is there and then, okay, what can I do about it? And it's an indicator, right? You should go and have a talk with someone. Uh, and that's one example, right, of just like listening. But I, I, I think that's self-love, or that's how I, how I in, like, th- like what resembles self-love for me is listening to yourself, mm. and then being there for yourself. Yeah, beautiful. And that's what I do. Yeah. Not always as easy as I'm saying right now, but I, I definitely do try to do that as mm. much as I can. Mm. Uh, and that's self-love for me. Yeah, good. <laughs> nice. But how, like, yeah, how is this for you? Like, what, well, like, what is the, the definition for you of, like, self-love? What does that mean for you? Because I think it's also something that's quite different or can be something different for everyone. Yeah, I think definitely it's a, it's a very individual, personal thing. Yep. Um, and I think for girls... Again, of course, I can only talk for myself, but what I, when I read about this and all sorts of, you know, wherever. Um, so wait, one yeah. second. Because it seems like you do read more about it than like that I do. Hmm. But so what do you feel exactly is for girls what self-love means? But then yeah. also what does self-love for you individually, yeah. you mean? Can you yeah. answer both of those? Yeah, yeah. Because like on a general basis, I think for most girls what we think about when we think about self-love and self-care it's about pampering ourselves i think pampering is definitely something that comes up a lot okay. that we, we go to this we go to spa and we, we get treatments and we mm. get our nails done and we get our hair or head massaged or a body massage and stuff like that okay so i think pampering and doing that just going into letting somebody pamper us or like pamper ourselves is definitely like laying in a bathtub, lighting the candles is a very cliche thing, Mm -hmm. but it's definitely something that we are, uh, that comes up really fast when we talk about today, I'm going to look after myself. If I say that to to my girlfriends, they are like, Oh, which long way, you know, which, which, you know, which uh, spa are you going to? I mean, that's like the number one kind of, or that I, I'm just saying that, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm going to lay in a bathtub and just, you know, have the plink long music. And they're like, oh, that's so self-care day for you. And I'm like, yeah, it is, you know. Uh. So it's definitely about, I think it's, a, it's a, also about stepping into that feminine energy and receiving love. Uh-huh. From yeah. not as love as in doing good to your body, as in receiving a massage. Or, or, you know, putting yourself in the, the beautiful warm water with all the oils and the smells and all the stuff that we like. So it's definitely about going into the feminine energy um, that I think many of women, us women uh, miss because our lives are so busy. And, as, and for me in particular, because as a, you know, when I work for myself, it's, it's a very go 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 energy so and the go energy is definitely a masculine energy while the Mm -hmm. feminine energy is about receiving Mm -hmm. while the masculine energy is about giving so when you work for yourself as a female you quite quickly get into the habit of just give 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 or go 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 which is a very masculine energy so i know from for myself number one when i'm going to look after myself i go to the most expensive spa in the city and i just go like you know do me you know and i let them do like a whole rundown and i'm like oh i come out look you know my face is like a baby's bottom and my hair is you know all over the place and i'm like woo, you know i had such a beautiful day you know uh-huh. so that's definitely a, a a big one for us um and then another uh, big one just to move straight over to something completely different which is more of a mental self-care thing. And that is to say no, basically to put set, set healthy boundaries. Mm-hmm. Because also, again, women are taught somehow that, or I don't know if maybe we even do it uh, without even thinking, especially if you have kids, 
that you put yourself last. You always, you know, prioritize everybody else, your husband, your partner, your kids, your dog, God knows. And then you always put yourself last. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever people ask you for a favor or, you know, you never say no, you just say yes to absolutely everything. So I know that a nice self-care thing would, would be, and also is something that we talk about in magazines and God knows where that is healthy for all, for us to say no to learn how to say no you know and set the boundaries and also like how we want to be treated by our partner by our friends and our colleagues and bosses and stuff like that and actually standing up for ourselves is definitely also um a thing that uh would be on the self-care side of like a list or whatever but so how do you like what is the difference between self-care and self-love then Well, I think for me, at least, self-care is <clears throat> the physical thing that I do with my body, mm -hmm. while self-love is the way that I speak to myself. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's two very different things. Because it is two different it things, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because, I mean, it doesn't matter if I go to the spa and I lay there and I say negative things to myself, making myself feel bad, it mm -hmm. doesn't matter, you know. I have to do, I, to have it to be a you know, full effect of what you're actually doing, you need to do the self-love the way that you speak to yourself in addition mm. to getting your mas my body massage or whatever, you know. So it's... Um, I mean, self-love and self-care self go intertwined together though. Yes. And I think for maximum effect, you need to kind of bring both with you into yeah. whatever it is that you're doing, you know. Um, yeah, and it's, it's just so surprising when I talk to women, um, about stuff and it was just, uh, I was just having a conversation with a woman uh, last weekend and, and she's very competitive. Like she's always competing with guys and she's always wanted, he always wants to be best and everything. And it's, and she knows this. So she makes fun of herself because she knows she's very competitive. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have this, um, trail here which is a lot of steps going up and up and whenever you go these steps you always time yourself because it's like a competition that everybody has whether other or self or with like uh, the city that is you know <laughs> the best time of those stairs you know okay. it's like then you really fit and we were talking about this this stairs and this trail and she was like oh i just want to go there you know and and not feel bad and and go there and without timing myself and I'm like, but why, why is this so hard? You know? And, and then, you know, the conversation was going on for a long time. And then, the, but the, the point was that she was, if she didn't, if she timed herself and she, if she wasn't happy with the time that she got, mm. she would really down, 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 you know, because she wasn't fit enough. Everybody else was going past her. She was fat or, you know, giving herself all this shit. And, and, and I was like, but isn't it possible to go up there and, you know, just say to yourself, but this is how my shape is like, this is how I'm feeling today. So today I spent three more minutes than what I would do in a, in a better day, you know? And, and it was just surprising how mean she would be to herself, you know, beating herself up so badly for yep. something that is so completely stupid in a way, because it doesn't mean anything, you know, it's yep. just a staircase. I mean, you can just do it, whatever, you know? Um, but it was just, uh, and then I just started realizing, shit, you know, uh, it, it, we are so hard on ourselves and we really, really need to start working on, uh, yeah, the, the way that we speak to each other or to yep. ourselves rather. So I'm just thinking, you know, is this a thing that guys, I mean, obviously you guys must do this too. Say yep. bad things to yourself, you know? Of course. But do you, but do, you do you talk about this that you, uh, I mean... Is this an awareness around this that you talk about this stuff or? There is, but I think, like I said, I think we just use another vocabulary of words to talk about it than just saying like self-love. Let's talk about self-love. Yeah. Uh, but not to say that we don't use that word, but I, yeah, I think we just use different, or at least in my friend group, uh, I feel like we just use different words uh, to get mm -hmm. to the same in the end. Um, but it's more like, yeah, taking care of yourself, the internal dialogue that you have with yourself you know, yeah. the voice that it is. And, and uh, so we, we do have that. But mm. I, again, I do think the friends that I have is not the 
standard kind of guys, at, like in a way that most, I think, don't talk about this at all. Mm, no. Like, I, I've never heard many of my friends say this. I'm quite sure, like, about, well, quite sure. Like, I, I, I do think more like an 80% of guys in general mm. do not talk about this. Mm. Or not as frequent as it should be, at least. That's for sure. Uh, but like, I'm sort of feel like I'm more in the 20% of the guys who are more open-minded, more wanting to develop themselves yeah. and, and, you know, yeah. who see the, the value of it, um, that do talk. About yeah. Because this. I mean, I mean, if, because if you look at the stats for, you know, suicide rates for guys, yeah. for instance, sky high, I mean, you guys are like on the top. So I'm like, this We're winning should is... be on. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, yeah. You know, it's, it's horrible. And it's, it's, it's definitely something. I think should be talked more about mm -hmm. uh, because we talk about it a lot. And I mean, I'm not saying that women are not, you know, in a miserable state of mind a lot yeah, of the time. Are. We are definitely sure, sure. And maybe we do it more. I, mean, I, I feel that women are more hard on ourselves than guys. It could be only because I have this impression because we mm -hmm. talk about it more. Um, and so I hope guys are not as hard on themselves because whenever I, say how I talk to myself sometimes to guys they are like what no mm. you know and then you guys are more like somehow black and white in a way I mean it doesn't sound to me that you are as strict on yourself and hard on yourself as we are but just basically yep. your your perception of of life and, and how you do things like if you can't do anything about it forget it you know while we would go like on and on and on about stuff you know and whenever I say something that's bothering me to my male friends, they're like, hey, you can't do anything about it. Leave it. You know, mm -hmm. let's move on and, and talk, you know, think about something else more positive. And I'm like, how can you just drop something like that? And I'm like, yeah, but you can't do anything about it. And I'm like, but still, you know, it's going on and on in my mind. So it, it seems like guys have a different set. The way that you think is different. Mm. So you don't nag so much about that stuff. It seems to me. I, I mean, obviously, I don't know this because I'm, I don't have a male brain. But, but I, sometimes I wish I did. <laughs> but I think this could be the part where you like that guys are more like like um, solution orientated. Yeah. So they yeah. try to more focus. Okay, like what can we do about this? Exactly. And again, I can't speak for all guys, right? Um, mm. But I think yeah, for a majority, they're more like okay, can we do something about this? Yes or no. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, what? No. Okay. Then let's just yeah. deal with it. Then like that way. Uh, and I think, yeah. <laughs> and I do feel like, I, like w with women that they have more like a beauty image that they have to reach. Mm -hmm. So I think there's more pressure on that than with guys. Mm. Um, and that, that could be one other reason of why their internal dialogue, it's more like negative because they have more things to compare themselves to. Like how many Instagram models you know, are there not? Like, there's so many of women, right? Yeah. And that's quite toxic. Like, comparison in general is quite toxic. But then also, if it, like, the body and, like, yeah. Mm. So, I think there's more things for women to compare themselves to. And I think that's where the conversation just keeps feeding itself from. There's more. Yeah. yeah. But, of course, guys think negative, of course, too. Uh, and another thing that they might not always say that they might just say like, yeah, I don't think about it while they might actually think about it. That could be also a thing, right? So it's a couple of things. It's never just the one. It, it, it's never just one straight answer. Um, it's more complicated always, but, but yeah, it's hard. <laughs> I can only speak for myself in the end. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. No, but, it's, um... but so how would you then define like self love for yourself? Oh, okay. So <clears throat> this is actually quite uh, interesting because when I was in Bali and I had all these conversations with our friend Edith about this, um, then I all of a sudden figured out a way like a tool for myself that I haven't really thought about before. And I was really surprised when I discovered it. And I'm like, why I did not think about this before. <laughs> and, and I think like, um, I have to use my dog as an example because I don't have children. Again, where's, Lu I'm where's Ludwig? Where is he? 
I let him out to go off to my parents. So it's, it's fine. He's taken care of. <clears throat> so, so it's uh, <clears throat> because, again, you know, I can be really hard on myself. And, and of course, that is not a, a good thing. You know, I mean, it's, <clears throat> it's good in the sense that I, I push myself. But, you know, at some point, it's not really constructive anymore. You know, it, it reached, it reached the const- you know, it's being constructive. And then, it, you know, it's just, yeah. it's just depleting and, and horrible. It's like the thing um, with getting drunk. At some point, you're drunk, but then you just keep yeah. drinking. You don't get up. You just go down. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, so it's kind of like that. So then I, um, then I realized that whenever I, you know, um, so, um, so when you, when I, oh, okay, I have to say this too, only for me. So when I start in the downward kind of spiral, when, you know, the, the darkness is coming and the, I call it the wolves are starting to dance in my head. Mm. Um, I, uh, very easily then start picking up really bad habits in terms of you know stuff that is not not good for me either i would start smoking or i would eat some junk food Mm -hmm. or i would not go hiking which i you know i know i normally would but then i'm just i'm not gonna do that i start you know procrastinating doing stuff that's not really healthy healthy and helpful for me um and um and then of course i would say really bad things to myself you know like oh you're useless you know now you're being lazy and you're you know you're stubborn and you're you know all this you know i'm not good enough and all that stuff you know and then i just came to realize that you know would i I, whenever i get all these thought patterns and and habits that i all of a sudden start picking up again i have to ask myself would you recommend recommend Ludwig to take a cigarette right now (laughs) like would you recommend him going you know to McDonald's and have a Mm. a shitty meal or would you recommend him to do this and of course that my answer would be no and then I'm more like so what would you recommend him do right now you know and then and then um and then whenever I say bad stuff to myself like would you ever say this sentence to him Mm. and my answer is always like god no and then I'm like, so I have this, so I started like this dialogue with myself and like, so, and then I ask myself, so what would you say to him then? And I would say the, the sweetest things ever, you know, but it's, and it's, it comes so easily when I imagine that I'm speaking to him or I, if I was a mother, I think I would do the same with the child. Yeah. So then I'm, I'm just trying to, I give myself self-love because I, it comes so naturally and so easy when I think of somebody else and then I just have to kind of flip the mirror and then, you know, it, it, speak to myself like that instead. And it's been so useful and it's yep. so simple and it's amazing to feel that shift, mm. you know, from, from being like, oh, you're so stupid and you're not good at this and what do you think you are and all that stuff. And then going, hey, 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 stop it. You know, you would never say this, Ludwig. You know, what would you say to him? And like, okay, you're just having a bad day. You know, go and watch Netflix and go to bed, you know. And then I think it would be, it is just such a, a, a different way of, I don't know, experiencing what's going on. And it's absolutely amazing. So I'm so happy I figured this out. <laughs> that is such an amazing tool mm. to... You know, when you're going through something difficult, <clears throat> you know, to and, and to talk instead of, you know, how would you yeah, exactly respond to a, a good friend of your, yours on how they basically approach what you're going through? And uh, yeah, many times the voice gets softer to your yeah. best friend or to Ludwig in this case, mm. and it will be to you. But... Mm. It's not helpful to have such a harsh voice at all, right? So that soft voice most of the time is the one that, that can bring the real change. So that's a really great tool. Uh, tool. And uh, yeah, it's good that you're sharing that actually too. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. It kind of sounds like you're sometimes very very harsh on yourself actually <laughs> i am it's just horrible you know and i and i wonder sometimes i really wonder where does it come from because i can't really remember anybody saying this to me at any time mm-hmm. so i'm just like so and this is more like also like a general question like where does all this shit 
that we tell ourselves, where did, the, where did it actually come from? Because it sounds like it's accumulated over years that maybe somebody said like something, maybe something that was resembled it, or maybe somebody said something to someone else and you overheard, or maybe your mom said to your father or opposite, or two friends said it to each other. And it then it seems like you're like a little sponge and you kind of suck it in. And all of a sudden it becomes your own demon, like your inner talk somehow. It's kind of fascinating how, because nobody ever told me mm-hmm. the things that I tell myself, as I can remember at least. I mean, this kind of has to do with like self-esteem. And kind of hate. Like, how do you think of yourself in general? Mm. And like, if you have to be like truly, truly honest, right? Mm. And that can be super difficult right, to say. Yeah. But like, are you asking you... me or are you is like a hypothetical? No, I'm asking you. Ooh. Oh, this shit. Um... I know. Mm. Yeah. No, like I in mean, general, do you think mm. most of the time good of yourself or are you most of the time very harsh on yourself? Mm. I think it's a, it's a good 50-50 to be honest. Maybe okay. a little bit more on the positive side, but definitely I have some, <clears throat> some stuff that, I, <clears throat> that I, I'm annoyed about by myself. <clears throat> and it's, <clears throat> sorry, because I'm aware of my flaws and then, uh, and so whenever things are not working out the way that I want, or when I feel like I'm stuck, I'm like hitting my head against the wall, this always comes up like, yeah, but it's because you don't do anything about these things, you know? Why don't you do things about, you know, why don't you change this kind of thing? So it's, it's more like, a, I'm more like, come on, get over yourself, you know, start doing something about this. And then I'm like, but I can't do it. It's so hard. So I'm, I'm having more like an argument with myself more mm. than I'm not saying that, but you're not, you're not good. Or I'm not saying I'm not that harsh. Um, but um, I'm definitely feel like I put a hammer in my head sometimes going like, you know, why are you the way that you are when I feel insecure about something, you know? I mean, this kind of thoughts can come from a variety of different things. Um, but you're very self-criticizing on yourself. So it means that somewhere in the past, maybe you felt like you were letting someone down. Mm. And maybe it was in school. Maybe it was your parents. Mm. Maybe your brother. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have enough information, I think, to say something on this. But... It definitely came somewhere from the press, right? On not being enough for something or for someone. Mm. And it could be a variety of different people, right? That, you know, uh, came, you know, build that up uh, on why you're thinking this of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting, though, to see, like, to kind of listen to it. And I, yep. and also, this one thing also I want to add to this because i remember when we had our we had a conversation about this in bali the last night we were in changu together we had a conversation about this and i and i asked both you and it what you guys um so like when the demons are telling you to do whatever stuff they want you to do or like as in not saying that (laughs) that you're schizophrenic or anything but it's more like when you are when you're realizing that you have a shit storm going on in your mind, mm-hmm. what do you do mm. when you kind of play along with it in a way, you know? And we had this conversation and I, <clears throat> and I think also for me, sometimes, I don't know if this comes in as self-love, but sometimes just accepting those thoughts mm-hmm. and saying like, right, okay, here we go again. Okay, Mr. Wolf, what are you trying to tell me? Because yep. it's very often uh, my ego or something trying to protect me from something, you know, trying to protect me from getting hurt or doing a mistake, you know, making a fool of myself or, you know, trying to protect me somehow. 
So that's where the ego and the, and the kind of wolf comes in and say, hey, you shouldn't be doing this because on the other side, if you fuck up, this is going to happen. You know, you're going to, something bad is going to happen. So sometimes I think as part of a self-love routine is just acknowledging that mm -hmm. voice and just listening to it yep. and saying, all right, hello, Mr. Wolf, I hear you. All right, so get your shit out. And then once you can't come up with anything more and go like, are you done now? You know, okay, I'm going to, you know, and either if that is, you know, going to McDonald's or having a cigarette, you sit down and then I have the cigarette and then I have it and I feel like shit. And then I'm like, all right, you feel better now? Like, are you done now? You know? And I'm like, oh, okay. So that was 10 minutes of pure being like oh feeling sorry for myself and going through that shit storm but it's still very important to acknowledge it because it's trying to tell you something yep so you know? the best way to approach this because when you do go to mcdonald's when you do take that cigarette you're actually running away in a way right the best way to kind of handle this and it's not easy right but it's actually before you run away to just literally go and sit down and mm. just listen mm. to what's gonna ha what's happening and it's not gonna be pleasant it's not it's gonna be painful right like all those emotions what you're feeling it's not easy but it's the best way to approach this to just sit down and just really listen from an observative point what's mm. happening because like you said emotions negative positive they're indicators they're signals of change. They want to signal something to you of what needs to happen. And with negative ones, it's, yeah, change, right? With positive ones, it's just like, yeah, you should do this more. But if you don't listen to them and you run away, you go have McDonald's, you go and have a cigarette, you run away from them and you don't receive the signal that they're trying to signal to you and the message that they're trying to communicate. And so the way to receive it is just to sit down. And again, it's really hard. It's easy to mm. say now, but it's hard to do this. But it is the approach to sit down, be in the presence, and listen, not judge, listen, and see mm. what it, your emotions are trying to say to you. Mm. And then from there on, you have the information to react in, in yeah, in yeah, what needs to happen. Mm. And I yeah. It was just interesting though, when I brought up this concept of accepting it, because I don't know if either you, you guys didn't understand what I meant, or uh, maybe I didn't explain it properly, but both of you were like, no, you should, you should try and, and, and you know, do all these like maneuvers to kind of get away from the, the, th the thoughts. And I was like, no, but that's not what I'm trying to say. You were like, oh yeah, you should, because I asked you, what, what, how do you handle when your wolves are taking over in your head? And you were like, oh, I would go for a run or, and, and Edith would say something else and she would do this and that. And I'm like, no, no, but what, what are you actually doing when you're playing along with them? And you were like, ah, oh, you shouldn't play along. And I'm like, no, no, but that's like, it did, didn't, didn't, at the time, I mean, we're all a little bit drunk and all that. So, and maybe I didn't explain it properly. So, and I, but I just didn't feel like accepting we were, wolves were a bit of a, a, a thing that you would even consider. And I was like, oh, wow. Mm. Okay. That maybe something that is a new to both of you or is it something that i don't know it's um it was just uh it was interesting to see your reaction because both of you immediately jumped on how mm. to kind of get away from the situation how to get out of the situation and it was just like really uh interesting to uh, to observe your reaction when i was kind of laying out the concept of accepting it so the answer that i said now or you know my reaction was this the one that you feel more like that you resonate more with than the one that I gave back then. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. But it, it sounds like you understand uh, a bit more what I'm trying to, mm. the concept itself. While there it was more, no, I, I you know, how to handle the, the, de the demons yep. more than accepting them kind of, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, I remember actually now again where we were in Bali. <laughs> Yeah, we were on the beach. Yeah, and I, I was quite drunk. So, like that answer, what I gave back then. Yeah, it's not a great answer. Um, it, I, like it, not in a way like it. it it's a way to to cope with it, but it's not a way to fix it. 
And yeah, I gave an answer yeah. to co-op with it. But the fix it to really understand it so you can fix it, right? Is to sit with it and to really listen yeah. to what's happening inside. Those other ways of like going for a run, I can't remember exactly what I said, but uh, are more ways of kind of like uh, reducing the voice and kind of running away from them, right? And it's a more healthy way than going for McDonald's or a smoke. But it's not in the end going to fix because that voice, those demons, you can't leave demons. <sighs> yeah, if you don't give them a place, they're going to keep coming back. And yeah. that's with so many things in life, like a trauma, for example, as well. If you don't heal it, it's going to keep coming back in, in a way, right? Mm. Um, mm. So, but it's quite surprising how much just the present, being in the present and truly listening, and this sounds kind of so simple in, in, in a way, right? But how much that can actually resolve because mm. you can hear, you listen to those demons and what they're trying to tell you. And mm. so going for a run, if I said that, uh, yeah, no, don't do it. Well, don't do it if you don't want to, don't do it if you want to fix it. Yeah. If you want some, some quick way to reduce the voice, then yeah, do that. Mm. Um, but if you want to fix it, then listen to them mm. and truly take your time. Don't just listen for a minute. Don't listen for five minutes. Listen for half an hour or an hour. Mm. Just listen. And again, hard because a lot of people don't want to sit down and listen. Yeah. So that's, yeah. 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 No, it was just, I think the initial, my initial question back then was I wanted to hear like what you do when you know that you are doing something destructive to yourself, you know, mm. in a way. Um, so yeah, because I asked either this question again uh, later on and I was like, so what do you do when you just that evening? No, no, later on, at some point, I don't know when it was, but I, because I, I didn't feel like any of you kind of actually understood asked, you. No, but you didn't actually, I didn't feel like you actually understood the question and therefore didn't answer it. So I, I was really trying to kind of like, I want to know, like, what is your thing? Because I know what my things are. And, it, you know, it's something that, I, of course, I'm not proud of, but I'm still willing to admit that I do them. Yep. Because I know, like, when I have a cigarette, I know what I'm actually doing. I'm not mm. sitting there, like, oblivious. You're I know that what I'm trying to, it's like, I know it's a destructive pattern. So I asked her again, um, and, um, and I think it came down to, like, yep, yeah, she would eat cookies, or she would eat something sweet. Mm -hmm. So she would, def she would go for the food um, destructive pattern or whatever that she had. She would go for something that she knew she didn't really should eat or whatever. Mm -hmm. um and i know i would my thing is i would have a cigarette um so so yeah so <laughs> are you asking so, yeah. what my thing is <laughs> <laughs> so what are you doing when you know you're doing something destructive <laughs> but like like destructive in like which like well yeah to yourself um I know this is a very personal one, so... <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, well, I don't mind if it's personal. I'm just really thinking now of... And uh, for sure, like, I could think of, like, self-destructive. Like, uh, I do have many times also, like, quite a, a, um, a harsh voice inside uh, me um, that is pushing a lot. Um yeah, I do have that voice quite often. Um, and it helps as a way to motivate. But sometimes it definitely gives me sleepless nights because okay. I feel stressed because I should work and do things instead of sleep. <laughs> it's, it's telling you that you're lazy or something. Yeah, also, also, yeah. Um and that's why I do have sometimes a hard time to take a break, like to watch a Netflix series and be okay with that. Because I feel like I'm, I'm not contributing to the world. I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm being lazy, exactly. Uh, so I, that voice is definitely, a, yeah, one that's there uh, at times. 
Um, and how do I cope with it? Actually, and I am in the process of learning to cope with that voice too. I would, if I would be very honest. Uh, and but it, I am, like I said, sitting down with it and listening to it of what it's trying to tell me. Uh, that's one. But then also sometimes like people that I look up to uh, and just Googling what they do and the internal dialogue that they have and what is helping them and uh, learning that it's quite human <laughs> to take breaks and that it's quite healthy to take breaks. And I don't want to cast like a wrong impression that I always do that, right? Because uh, I really love what I do. I really feel like I'm contributing something to the world with it. And I really care a lot about it, but sometimes it can be too much too, right? Uh, but like just understanding just where that, that is coming from that voice. And it's, yeah, I'm, I'm more and more trying to just sit with it and listen to it. And so meditating, for example, is definitely one way to just sit with yourself. Uh, and I can just say what is helping me now, right? To go better with it. And it's been less dominating now over the last few uh, months, that voice. But uh, it used to be quite a, a, a lot there. But so it's less there because I do am meditating more. I am sitting more with myself when that is coming up. Um, so, Yeah. That's how I am slowly kind of co-oping more with it by just listening yeah. and then figuring out like, okay, where, where, why, why do I feel like I should always do this? Should always work. Yeah. And, uh, and that's where you can then continue working on. And that's what I'm doing now too. So, yeah, so you are a kind of workaholic, like I, like I busted you on in, in Bali already. <laughs> I was but, like, you're working way too much. You were like, no, I like what I do. And I'm like, yeah, but you need to take a fucking break. <laughs> I know, but yeah. <laughs> but, you know. So maybe what you do instead of going to McDonald's or having a cigarette, you sit down and you work. Yes. <laughs> and maybe, yeah, maybe that's kinda. your Achilles. Yeah, you Maybe that's your Achilles. You said you work instead of going to McDonald's and having and a nasty veggie burger. You work. But it kind of hurts when someone calls me alcohol a workaholic. Yeah, and I don't. I, I know. No, no. And I know don't, that, that you don't mean it in that way because it's sort of this love and hate. not. Well, hate is not the right. But like, like I love what I do, but it's easy to overdo it and not take any breaks and not sort of enjoy life around me, right? party or whatever yeah exactly right i could totally do this so much more than i do at the moment not like i don't do it not like i don't go on trips like i totally do that too mm. but i am more aiming i am more planning those things because i feel like okay i could totally plan more trips in because i don't do that too much in the end uh, so i totally could do it more um uh, like where was it going with this that would be your self-love thing taking more breaks yeah. oh yeah that's true yeah it's true actually yeah uh, just uh yeah taking breaks from that uh but being a workaholic can be sometimes it's sort of like the same like being like reading a book it can be a very easy protect procrastination where you could be like oh but i'm reading a book it's okay you know it's like i'm i'm working on something i'm developing something and with yeah. work it can be the same like oh but it's okay i'm working you know i'm building further i'm you know yeah. but there's always an extreme any extreme is unhealthy and i do catch myself going to the extreme of work hmm. times and hmm. <laughs> it's hard to i'm happy i'm happy to hear you say that because i was a bit worried like does he not see this i'm like wow <laughs> yeah it's hard to admit but it's definitely an extreme <sighs> yeah and it's more than an acceptable acceptable extreme because it's something that quite some people do right yeah and it's more easily to see it in other people to see that it's not healthy in them than it is in you with yeah everything right yes so it is a hard thing to admit but it is true that i do at times 
overdo it that and that I could slow down. And even if I would slow down, I would still work a lot. Exactly. <laughs> but it's the realization and it's sort of like when you're used to like driving in like gear 20 and you all of a sudden have to slow down to gear four, four, 14 it feels much lower when most people might be driving in gear six. Exactly. You're still driving much faster, but it's still <laughs> slower than what you're used to. Yeah. And yes, I'm, uh, it is a, it's the thing that I'm working on. I'm glad to hear. <laughs> and I'm actually truly by, yeah, like I said, I don't want to come into repeat now, but like by listening to that voice, what is it trying to feed? when I'm working, when I'm overworking, what am I trying to feed by that? And that's, yeah, self-love actually by, uh, by being okay. It's okay to work a bit less. <laughs> yeah, you're not lazy just because you're not on like, Whoa! all the yeah. time. Mm. Yeah. But it's harder to put more tips on that when I'm in the sort of process, I would say, in it yeah. myself so i can only yeah. share what is helping yeah uh, but yeah yeah now i i really want to remember when, I, when we talked a little bit about being avoidant before uh being, on the being last what? Conversation. avoidant avoidant yeah we talked about um, um attachment styles and oh and, um, yeah. yeah and stuff like that and because i feel like sometimes people who are you know, dismissive avoidance or like don't have that secure relationship style towards people or, or whoever mm -hmm. that they then use all these distractions to kind of stay in oh, yeah. that avoidance mo mo mode in a way, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that would be definitely a, a, a whole new world to kind of explore when we are, why, you know, why do you like, like right, right now we're talking about you, you know, why do you keep on working so much? You know, are you trying to yeah. avoid something? And, and, you know, and that kind of like, yeah. Well, uh, avoids yeah. or yeah. proof can be also a thing, right? Sorry, avoid or? Avoiding or proving something could be also a thing. Mm. Proving something to yourself, you mean, or? To yourself or to others. I'm not saying mm. for me now, right? But sometimes people do overwork or keep working because they want to prove something to someone that they yeah. are worthy enough. And many times it has to do with self-esteem actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, saying that you're good enough, you know, that you are worthy of love because you have achieved all these things, you know? Yeah. And comparison. Yeah. Like it's a thing for, for almost everyone, mm. especially it's these a days. Huge topic. <laughs> It is a huge topic and it, it's, it, it's a hard topic for people to admit, mm. for women to admit that they compare themselves to other bodies of other women, for men to admit, you know, I mean, like with muscles or like, I mean, and, and with work and, and there's so many topics of comparison, right? Mm. But people do it and these days more than ever and it's really toxic. It's really toxic. Yeah, you shouldn't do it. No, no uh, but it's tough. It's really tough to do that, yeah. All right. So to, to, to make things more dynamic again, <laughs> let me ask you a question. And I don't want to move away unless you, if you had to add something no, more. Or if you... No, no, no. I'm just going to put someone, oh. I'm just going to plug you in again. I'm not moving. You, I'm not leaving. <laughs> you had enough of this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Like, all right, I'm out of here. Bye. <laughs> no. All right. All let right. Me... Shoot. Yeah, let me ask you a question, and I wish I had more lighter one first, but it's, um... oh, I do actually, well, no, I don't. I, well, let me ask this one first, before I ask the real, the, the, the more personal, personal, personal one. Woo! <sighs> let me ask this one first, right? I'm just, this is just a question that I wonder about, um, but, uh, so, Tim Ferriss, I, I, I think I dropped the name with you before, but it's someone, some person, a person that I really look up to. Uh, but this is a question that he often asks in his podcast too. And I thought it was a really interesting question that I would like to ask you as well. Okay. So what is a past failure or a hard time? And I maybe customized 
the, the question a little bit. But so what is the past failure or hard time that set you up for a future success? Um, so that means that the success has already happened. So something that in the past happened that was a failure or yeah. something in the past that was a really tough time that in, yeah. the, in the end now ended up being a success, something that you would have never thought would have led to this. Mm. Could be with your business, could be in your personal yeah. life. You know. Yeah, I have, <laughs> I have two. <laughs> well, actually more than no, two. No, you can I'm only happy. share one. I can only share one. Okay, that's <laughs> no. Go ahead. Uh, you can totally share. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no. But it's like, it's a, it's a, in a personally uh, for the personal version uh, example, they are definitely um, something that has been re repeating itself for years that I finally have managed to break in a way. Okay. That's one thing. But when I can do this, sell the business. Um, example first maybe because setting up my own business this is that my my second attempt so the first attempt i had i failed all right um, yeah so mm. then i i'm not going to give you the whole long story but the conclusion of the failure uh back then uh is that i wasn't prepared for it basically i mean that what i when i sit now and think back at what went wrong mm -hmm. Is that I wasn't uh, God my mom hi you're no, so busy you're this. so busy over there <laughs> Hello? I go to the toilet yeah. <laughs> all right so we have to backtrack a little bit <laughs> we, have, we have to back back uh, track a little bit oh uh, it well um, a little yeah. a little bit but uh, I can cut this quite cleanly okay so um you were saying um something <laughs> yeah no that that uh when i so um what i have learned from my previous uh fuck up or that you didn't say fuck up you had something very <laughs> more, much more diplomatic word what was that <laughs> that is the <laughs> yes yes <laughs> I just so because your your past uh well attempts to to, to become self-employed didn't work out. Yeah. yeah. No, it didn't work out. Yeah. So I realized that um, basically, <laughs> fuck up sounds better. It doesn't. It's more. It's more honest. It's more real. <laughs> it is more real. That's true. Failure is so diplomatic. You know, it's so fluffy. Um, no, but um, what I I'm happy that I didn't succeed in the sense that I realized that I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't mentally prepared for it. I wasn't structured enough. I didn't have enough belief in myself. I didn't. I I'd, I hadn't really thought through enough things, basically, mm. which became very clear uh, as as I went along, and which is why it failed. Yep. So now, at my second attempt, I knew much more, and I was very much more like clear in my mind what sort of stuff I needed to have taken care of. And also, but it was it's definitely also much more of um, a feeling that I was uh, mentally prepared for it. And I, I had grown in these years that I then went back to, a, you know, eight to four kind of job. So I felt much more prepared for it. Just basically, I, I believed that what I'm presenting to the world right now, I believe in 100%. Yeah. I believe yeah. that I'm, I'm capable of doing this. I know that the market is going to accept it. And I, I, you know, I didn't know I was going to make any money on it, but I just believed in the concept a hundred percent. Well, before I believed in it, but I still had lots of doubts if I was going to be able to pull it through and I didn't see how I was going to pull it through. Well, now I had a very clear strategy or a very clear vision of how I was going to be able to pull it through. I mean, I didn't know if I, if I would succeed, but at least I saw what I needed to do very, very clearly mm -hmm. whilst before I didn't. So it definitely helped me uh, in succeeding this time, I'd say. <clears throat> I think that's a good thing that you said because a lot of people think that you have to do like the first time will always like, you know, that you can't have more than one attempt. Mm. And it's kind of the same like we're going for your driving license. You know, most people 
don't succeed the first time in getting their driving license, like the practical run one, right? Mm. It's quite common, yeah, in the business to 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 kind of fuck up, like you said, the first time. Because mm. and and it's quite yeah, so it's quite needed in a way to then really learn what you have to do to do make it work. Mm. Uh, and actually, for me, it was the same. Yeah, like the first attempt that I went officially self-employed, I, it just didn't work out. Uh, and so I had to stop it and then uh, take a year to really figure it out and then do it again another, yeah, the year after. But were you trying to do the same thing that you were doing now or were you trying to do something else? Yeah, so it's so complicated to explain the whole journey because it really was just a journey. Like I knew the concept of what I wanted to build like okay. in my head, but I didn't, it's sort of like I knew, like I had the feelings inside, but I didn't have the words to explain it. And okay. so the same there, I knew the concept, but I didn't know exactly how it was going to be built out in, in, in the real world. And so it took really a couple of years, like three years before I really figured that out with a lot of trial and error before I got where it is now. And so, yeah, the first time just failed miserably in a way that I wasn't able to sustain it financially. So, you know, I I just had to cut it off like the the self-employment status because you have to pay so much money here in Belgium for just having that status. Uh, So, yeah. Um, but then it helped in a way to, to think more. Uh, it helped just on the journey of, of the, the filtering out and the, uh, yeah, uh, the process of getting to where it is now. Uh, so yeah, I think for quite some people, the first attempt is not the one, the finished one. <laughs> no, no, I feel uh, the same way. Uh, yeah. it, it, I always hear like, oh no, I tried, I, I had an attempt, I had to go at this, you know, a couple yeah. of years ago, it didn't work out, whatever. But I think, but, but I think one of the key things is some sort of belief in yourself mm. also, uh, that is something that you, is absolutely, that's absolutely fundamental to succeed. Mm-hmm. You really need to believe that you can actually pull this off and that people that this has, uh, this is so important that, that, you know, it really belongs in the world as a product or a service, you yep. know, yep. you really need to believe it hundred percent yourself because you have to argue this surprisingly enough, a million times to your best friends, to your parents, <laughs> to your grandparents, to yep. everyone you, you think automatically would support you who don't, mm-hmm. they're like, what the fuck are you doing? You know, you're going to give up your secure job, your secure uh, income, whatever, because they are only focused on security while you're going to go and explore something in a, on an adventure that is completely not secure whatsoever. And they all are like, that was one of the biggest surprises I got from my life was that when I was like, try, when I was explaining to people that I wanted to do this and I've been, many of them were like supporting and they're like, yeah, you go, go, go. But a lot of them was like, were like, but how are you going to pull this off? I mean, they, they could not see. I mean, they were like definitely pulling me back into like, you have to do what's secure, what's safe, you know, and, and just really pulling, like really pushing that security button, like that, that doubt button yeah. in me a lot. And even now when I've been like doubting if I should continue and I've been struggling and I mean it it happened even last year too I was you know telling my friends about it Uh, and I was like guys I don't know if I should do this anymore because I'm I'm tired I'm you know I'm not making that much money I'm blah 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 blah. and all of them pretty much except for maybe a few were like yeah yeah you should quit you know you should go back to having a eight to four job and I'm like what the fuck no, you shouldn't say this. You should say you should go, go for it. You know, work a little bit harder, do a little bit different things, do whatever. Don't tell me to stop. You have to tell me to keep on going because that's what I need to hear. I don't need you to press the insecurity button that I have even further in. You should like say, no, what the fuck are you talking about? Go on, you know, keep on doing what you're doing. 
So I'm just, and then I was like, I should stop taking advice from people because they only give advice, a very yeah. personal advice, and it's not objective whatsoever. You know, they are not thinking of my best. They're thinking of their best, or like at least in their world and their perspective. Yep. So that's actually one of my, the, one of the biggest, you know, if anybody asked me to give a new entrepreneur some advice, mm. never listen to anybody in terms of, the ones who are trying to pull you back and say, you know, this is not secure, this is not safe or financially, you know, whatever. Because they are just, they are just saying their own insecurities. It's nothing to do with you, you mm -hmm. know? It's just, it, it's just mind-blowing when you realize these things. I'm like, I thought you were on my side. And I'm like, yeah, but we want you to be able to pay your bills. And I'm like, yes, but I have a heart and I have a, I have a mission here. You know, you have to help me achieve it and not... Tell me to pay my bills for fuck's sake. I can pay my bills, you know, but I want to have more, you know, and that's like. So, I mean, they're giving the best advice that they can give to you in their world. Yeah. But like you said, you, for example, should not take cooking advice from me, mm. you know, because I am totally not an experience. I have no experience in there. So I think it's important to take advice from only people who have real experience yeah. in what they're giving advice in. Yeah. And it's always good to question like, you know, have you done this? Do you know what you're talking about? Yeah. It's always good to first ask that when, before taking the advice really in, because yeah. there's quite a lot of people who just give advice with no experience, but just because yeah. that's what they think, what they feel. And it could be correct. Right. But it's better to draw from experience from someone who's really who knows what they're talking about yeah. and to go on that more and to take your conclusion from that. Uh, so yeah. that's what I do as well. I don't, I take for very little people advice unless that I know what they're talking about. Hmm. Yeah. Good. <laughs> so I like your answer on your failure, hard time and how it turned into a success. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so uh yeah do do you have any other questions or any other topic that you had on your list before i ask my final one all right so i have one last topic but i don't know if we you want to move on with yours because what i'm going to talk about now is very different to anything that we have talked about before but that's the point okay <laughs> all right um, make it dynamic really all right so no no i mean i i already prepared you that you know my focus for this conversation is is all about being you know personal and it's it's uh yep. it's not so much um you know uh, professional as such um so when we have touched upon this topic a little bit before in some previous conversations but i i would like to talk about it a little bit more because i feel like i'm not done with it yet <laughs> Do you know what I'm, do you, can you, do you know, do you have like a vague idea of what it could be? We have talked about it, but you're not <laughs> done with it yet. So it's quite a no, big topic. Discovering new things. Ah, well, it could be about. <laughs> yeah, a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff, yes, but it could be about your brother. Nope. Nope, then nope. I do not, then I, I, I would like to be surprised. All right. <laughs> so it is the concept of open relationships. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, yeah, we just, yeah, all right, all right, all right, yeah. We have talked about that. All this. right, well, interesting. <laughs> it is, it isn't it? Because, I mean, like I said, we have talked about this before. Yes. And I have been turning my, like I have not lost sleep uh, over it, but I really, it has, has been on my mind a lot. Mm. Um, not so much recently, but you know, for the last, for the last month, I'd say, because mm -hmm. I had, well, I have to say the pleasure of getting introduced to the concept of, you know, uh, what an open relationship is. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I've had conversations you know, with the people that was in this open relationship to try to get my head around it and to really, really kind of dig into what it really is. Mm -hmm. and, and 
and what really the construction of this relationship is because it is so new to me and and i feel it was new to you too so we were like really baffling and both going like what, what you know what is this and and what's really going on here behind the scene in a way and and that's kind of what i wanted to talk to you or like i'll discuss a little bit today because because so the way that i've been the, you know the way that i've had this explained to me by these people before mm-hmm. These people, it sounds like they're like aliens. Not, <laughs> this, these people from these other planets. Oh, the image froze. Oh, yeah, you froze too. So. Hello. Ah. I can hear you. I don't know if. Oh, your internet connection isn't stable. What? Oh, internet. Hey. Okay. <laughs> You're back. Whew. I was like, hey. <laughs> yeah, that was that was my internet. Uh, okay. Doing All something right. very weird. Hold on. Okay. Let me just double check for a second. We're still recording. Yep. Mm, okay. <clears throat> Okay, well, all right, sorry. You said yeah. that um yeah. uh you, you said that uh you wanted to talk or discuss about open yeah. relationships. <laughs> yes. I think I think it's first of all, I think it's a hot potato. Uh <laughs> it is. It is. You definitely want to like, woo, you know, everybody's talking about it. It's like at least like it's getting more and more common in a way, or at least more I talked about people are more open about admitting or like saying that they are in one and Mm -hmm. at least much more I feel now than ever before yeah it could be just me being old and I don't know I have no idea but uh, definitely I feel like this is something a, a new concept that has come in that people now are embracing in their own individual uh terms mm-hmm. I, I guess so so it's it's so it's just and and you know we've like i said we've had this conversation before but i still feel like um because the way that i have then been introduced to the concept is that when there is like an overflow of love that's where that's that's why they they want to share their love with other people mm-hmm. which sounds like a very noble thing to do or feel it sounds very lovely to be able to uh, having the willingness to share your love and your partner with somebody else. Mm-hmm. But what I don't understand, and this is like where it kind of gets very confusing for me because, and then when I really start digging into, so how much are you actually willing to share of your partner with somebody else? Yeah. And then it's like, no, no, it's only sex. So I'm like, so what happened to all that fluffy, fluffy love thing that you wanted to share? You know, it's when you, it's, so it's like, no, it's, it's no sleeping over. It's no cuddly. It's, it's no sweet talk or pillow talk or whatever. It is hardcore sex. So, and, and, and that's it. And I'm like, but. So but I think that's not for like, every open relationship though. <clears throat> okay. I don't think for every open relationship, it's just about sex. <clears throat> Okay. Maybe I mean, like, like, or, or like, uh, from the information of, of like open relationships, like people in it that I've gathered, right. Uh, for some, it's also just about, yeah, not wanting to stop this feeling of love, not just wanting to keep it just for one person, but also wanting to give it to other people. Yeah. But how much are they then willing to give to the other person? Just their whole heart. Right. But every person is different. So they're giving a different parts uh to to that to that person right that they might not give to the other person or might not be able to give to the other person yeah but i'm just now i'm just really trying to be concrete like what Mm -hmm. how does that look in a day like would you then live with one person and live with another like how how does this actually look like but i think how it looks like is so different for so many people that it is not just one way 
it just really depends on the agreement, you know, that you make with your partner that you want to have an open relationship with. How the day looks just totally depends on the agreement that you make with each other. So it, it, like the answer to that, I think it can be so different. Um, but what do you feel from the last time that we spoke? Because, you know, yeah. if it's been on your mind, what do you feel from the last time that, you, that we spoke? Mm. What new thoughts, what new questions, what yeah, new answers do you feel came through you? Well, basically, I think for me, it sounds like it's an ego, uh, it's an ego thing. It's, we have an expression in Norwegian okay. saying that you can have pus or sack. That means <laughs> what? That Say that again. In Norwegian, we say, you want something, i pusa or sack. So, so is what that... We're <laughs> bag and a bigger bag. I mean... So oh, wow. I was going to say something totally different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Okay. Pusa sack is a... Pusa is a small bag. Sack, sack is, a, is a bigger bag. So uh, in Norwegian, uh, <clears throat> we would say that you want something and I mean you want you want you want both in a way so mm -hmm. you want like a, a safe uh, relationship that is loving and that is uh, comfortable blah 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 and then you also want to be able to explore you want you want the lust takes you you are then also allowed to go out and explore sexual uh, fantasies with somebody else and you want this uh, safe relationship kind of thing Mm -hmm. And for me, that sounds like very much an ego-based thing mm -hmm. um, because it sounds like, and in, in, in addition to that, it also sounds like uh, lust and love are somehow yeah. uh, mixed in a, this. It's, it's, it sounds like it's the same because they say, oh, I, I love this person that I met in a nightclub last night. No, that is not love. That is lust. Mm -hmm. You know, love is something that you feel it's for deeper. a person that is, you know, it's, it comes from a different place, you know, mm -hmm. just wanting to, I mean, I could definitely fall in love or be like super intrigued by somebody, by the way that they look and the way they are talk and the way they make me feel. And it can feel like love mm -hmm. because you're so intrigued by them. But knowing what love is, that is definitely not love. Come on. So it's just like, they want the love and the lust to get like they want it together and separately and it's it, it, for me it sounds like an ego thing and then it's being presented to me as a, a love thing and i'm like no <laughs> because you're just giving me the breadcrumbs you're not giving me i mean what you're really sharing is not love it's it's basically body it's physical you know so i do agree uh with the part of like that some might mix love and lust that they might mix that but i don't completely understand what you mean with ego <clears throat> it's an ego thing can you because, explain it a bit more because you want it you want to be satisfied on all areas you want okay. to be satisfied in terms of having a secure and the, the love from your partner that you've been with for some time and, and that security that that brings to you and you also also, in addition to that, you want to have the freedom mm. to explore any type of lust you would have with any type of person that you would meet at any time. Mm -hmm. And for me, that doesn't, that sounds like it comes from some sort of ego place. It doesn't sound like it comes from love. It sounds like I, I want to be satisfied at any cost, kind of. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't think it comes from love either. And I think I have to emphasize that this is my opinion. <laughs> um, yeah. But I don't know if it comes from ego. I think it comes more from, from, from past hurts. You know, from, yeah, issues with abandonment. I, and I, like, I really, I, from the people that I do know that have a, an open relationship, when I look a little bit at their past, it many times seems connected that they have some past, you know, uh, abandonment issues with their parents or something. Mm. And I feel many times this is connected to that, not being able to fully commit to one person, being afraid of that, of a past hurt. 
And then this concept of an open relationship gets introduced, which seems like the ideal thing to kind of have to not face their hurt from the past, their mm. wounds from the past. Mm. And I feel, and I'm not just basing it on one person, I'm basing it on a couple of people and also a little bit of what I've read on this topic that it many times is something with a, a trauma, with some mm. kind of abandonment issues. And again, I like I emphasized, it's my personal opinion still, but I see some kind of pattern there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, that's my conclusion as well, that there is some sort of, again, that uh, avoidant attachment. Mm, yeah, attachment, exactly. That you are avoiding that complete um secure loving feeling so it's it feels more secure to have it a little bit at distance yep. you know because then you don't have to go all in and yep. you are and it seems to me that the goal is to not feel jealousy and not to feel yeah like, so if you so if you if your partner that you love is with somebody else you don't care about it you know it's you're totally fine with it so you, what you're actually trying to do is just basically remove the emotions of mm. being attached to somebody. Yeah, yeah that's you know, interesting. It's super interesting because I'm like, you don't see this, you know? And I'm <clears throat> yeah. And it's, uh, it's like I'm not saying to you, but of course, but I'm like hypothetically, it's so avoidant, and and it's and it's um, and then they wrap it in as mm -hmm. it's in this fluffy air love. A velvet uh, fluffy thing and then yeah, yeah. it's really just being avoidant and not being able to receive love yeah um oh damn what damn it i just wanted to say something uh oh, damn. okay this is the alcohol that's doing not a good <laughs> job <laughs> oh, bro. uh what did you just say a couple of words ago of uh oh god damn this avoidance, alcohol. wrapping it in no, a little bit back. <laughs> Not being able to receive love or to... Um... Yeah, I totally got not what I wanted to say anymore. I totally lost that. Sorry. No, no, but it's not your fault. It's just, <laughs> it's just this bottle of delicious wine with this moustache. <laughs> it's fucking my brain up. Um, what did I want to say? Well, it's not going to come back like this. I felt like I had such a good thing to say, though. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it when that happens. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got, I'm just blank at the moment. Oh, uh, that's right. Um, let's see. Let's go. Yeah. Um, no, I think my, my whole point here is just like, at least my conclusion here to this whole concept is that it is something that is not right about it somehow. Mm -hmm. and i i feel like uh probably i feel like a dinosaur because it's this is like a new thing and a lot of people are embracing it mm -hmm. and it's just me not getting it but it still sounds like something is a bit off somewhere and they are wrapping it into something fluffy and beautiful right i think i got it again what i wanted to say uh yeah this is like like jealousy oh yeah this one so jealousy, for example, like the, the, the emotions that you feel in a relationship, there are quite a lot of emotions, right? Like jealousy is one of them. And it does seem like they're trying to avoid and try to dampen those emotions to not feel them at all. Yeah. To not feel jealousy at all by completely, you know, having multiple people that they could sort of be jealous about so they can learn to cope better with it in yeah. a way, right? Uh, but I think I also said this in, in uh, an earlier stage here in this conversation that all emotions have a function and trying to, to, to get rid of any emotions is really, it's not healthy because they have a function. They're there for a reason. And jealousy is really, it's there for a reason, right? And if you dampen it, if you try to get rid of it, you are trying to get away from something. And yeah, I, like you, I think I feel like I've not looked too much into it, 
uh, to the extent of that there could be so much more around it, but it to me does seem more of the time that they are trying to get away from certain emotions that really hurted them. And they do want to be in a relationship, right? But they don't want to completely listen to those demons, to those voices, to those emotions that they have. And they're really, really, really scared of them. And then an open relationship is a solution to not listen to them. <clears throat> because actually jealousy it's one of those things where you think like what's the reason like what's the function of it but it actually helps you to stay alert you know when you feel jealous you're like a little bit more alert like oh, okay maybe i should pay a little bit more attention to that person yeah so that that person he or she is not running away from me and in an open relationship you kind of want is it's it's sort of like yeah it's okay that they run away from me so, yeah, which kind of comes back to, again, like the attachment that they don't feel comfortable with feeling attached to someone because they're trying to train themselves to be okay with someone running away from them. Exactly. That's my conclusion on that as well. That's interesting. It is. It's, <laughs> that's why and, I want to bring this back up. <laughs> and it's a little bit troublesome in the way that it's sort of like um, more acceptable not like it's not acceptable, right? Not like I'm saying that you can't do uh, have an open relationship if you feel completely good with it. But it is more an acceptable form of walking away from your troubles. Hmm. And I don't know if people are really made for, for an open relationship. I don't know. I mean, the, 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 the reasons, I mean, the excuses or whatever. Um, exactly. I, because of those reasons why they're saying, I don't know if they're really made, if, I don't know if we're really, I'm not saying like, of course you can say everyone, right. But I feel in general, most don't. So, yeah. I mean, they are saying that we are conditioned to live the way that we live now. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that we are with one partner all our lives. Obviously, very many of us are not. I mean, we try out a few before we kind of get married or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it, to me, it sounds like they are like, oh, the, the society has conditioned us to be with one partner our whole life and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, but no, no, nobody, very few has been with one partner their whole life. I mean... So. Unless you are born or got a relationship in the 50s. Uh, if you're born from, you know, the 80s or 70s or whatever, you have not been with one partner your whole life unless you were, you know, living in some sort of, uh, you know, uh, in <laughs> closed group of people that would not allow it. Um, so, so that whole argument where that the society has conditioned us to be with one partner is not really, I'm not buying it because mm. it has in some sense. And I'm like, whenever I, I'm not religious, right? So whenever I go to church and, and when I go to in particular weddings and the, the, the priest is like t talking about uh, now two people will merge into one and whatever. And I'm like, oh, come on. We're not merging into one. That's never going to happen. And it's never been the point of, of marrying somebody. Uh -huh. You're marrying somebody because you want to have a, a teammate, a, 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 yeah. a, life, a life partner, you know, as in, a, a, you know, I'm, you, we're, we're a team in this. And are we going to uh -huh. build our life together? One person, one person. One person and one person does not make one. One and one makes two and not one, you know, mm. it's very simple. Yeah. Um, so that whole Christian concept of merging, it for me is completely, oh, I don't want to hear it. Um, but um, so, so it's, it's not really that construct either that society has conditioned us to be with one partner because you can definitely be with one partner your whole life, your whole adult life, I should say, mm -hmm. um, and be totally fine with it because Again, I'm like, so the challenges that you have, and because it all, it also seems like, so they would not share their partner if the relationship is not good. They would only share their partner with when the relationship is good. Mm. So I'm like, yeah, but here again, you, 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 the, the, you know, you, you keep biting yourself in the ass because, so you would share your partner when the relationship is 
good. So, but wouldn't that then provoke, so if you then shared it, you shared your partner with somebody, wouldn't that then put you back into the loop of not being good? I mean, because we are not machines, we are feeling human beings, you know? And, and just that, I mean, is really the goal not feeling anything? I don't really understand why that should be a goal. You know? That's not a good goal. No. It's just really, it's just, it's such a strange concept. And the more I think about it, the more things pop up in my mind. So, I mean, we can go on about this forever, but it's, it's fascinating. And, it, and, it, and now when more and more people are embracing this, I just have to ask like the wider question, like it, where is our society heading if this mm. is going now to be some sort of goal? If Isn't that, that sad? If that's yeah. going to be a sort of like a standard... Yeah, I don't think it's going to be a very healthy standard or like, do you know Esther Perel? Yes. Oh yeah, you do. You know, do you know that she's from Belgium? No, I oh, yeah. know that she has a funny accent, but I didn't know she was from Belgium. <laughs> No, yeah. I thought she was from Israel or something. I thought she was from like Middle East. Uh... I know. Well, no. So she's, I think, originally from Poland. Right. But she grew up in Antwerp. So here in Belgium, okay. actually. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. Good on you. Have you met her? <laughs> Sadly enough, no. But she would definitely be one of those people that I would so, you know, yeah. would love to, yeah, to meet. Uh, why did I bring her up? <laughs> <laughs> well, she has a lot well, of concepts on relationships. She, I mean, like, well, for everyone listening, like, she's definitely one of those people who, if you want to learn more about relationships, yeah, she's, I would like, she's an expert. She knows what she's talking about because that's what she does. She's done that for decades of years. She's done that so long. Hmm. Uh, but I think, oh, yeah, this is sort of the, the thing I think that I was going to touch upon that. Whenever a relationship gets tough and every relationship has those phases where you question things, the answer is not just to give up and to just go away. And I think if you have an open relationship with someone that can more easily happen than that you want to walk, that you want to work through it, through the tough times. Because tough times even just personally tough times help to grow they help, they make you grow and even in a relationship if you don't work through them you don't grow together as strongly as you could and i think in a way that an open relationship could kind of like help you avoid those tough times that you could go to the other partner and just kind of like forget about the, the other person right i don't think you're going to really experience the full experience of being together with someone in an open relationship mm. and i'm not trying to hate um, open relationship i'm sure for some people it can really work but i just don't feel the same like you might feel that it will be the answer to feeling the love that people seek actually in relationships it's oh, by it's by taking the complete experience the good and the bad it's kind of like when you have a marriage, right? Where you do this promise of like being there through sick times, through good times. It's kind of like that, right? You just be there for that person and really become a good team player together. Yeah. And you can't be a good team player unless you face bad times, really hmm. bad times. Okay. Yeah. And I think that's where an open relationship kind of, you can avoid that more. And I'm also like really questioning, what is it that the person who is in a relationship is offering the third person? Like, what is it for real that they are offering? Because to me, it sounds like it's a very physical thing they're offering. They're not really offering anything else. It's like being somebody's mistress. And you don't really want to be the, the second choice all the time. I mean, no sane person would be choose to be somebody's second choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least not in my world, and I would never choose to be somebody's second choice. I mean, yeah, no, I mean, it, no, I would never, never uh, say yes yeah. to that. So then you agree. So when you then accept to, to, to be with somebody who is in an open relationship, you accept to be number two. 
And why on earth would anybody accept to be number two? Mm -hmm. It's not a good feeling. I mean, and okay. And then you can say, all right, so maybe the only need I want this person to fulfill for me or, or give me is the sexual thing. Okay, fine. So, okay. So maybe that can work if, if the only thing you want is sex, because I think to me, it sounds like the only thing that the, that the person who's in the relationship uh, is going to give you is the, the sex. It's, it, they can't give you anything more because they are committed to the partner that mm. they're already with. And what they really want is just to, to explore and, and do some kinky shit with somebody else mm. and then kind of, you know, go back to their partner. So is this really, uh, it's also like who is actually willing to accept the terms that, yep. that the, this couple is giving you, you know, what does that say about the person willing to accept it? I'm not saying it is yeah. anything bad. It's just that you have to be very aware that you are going into this meeting this pe the person that you're willing then to, to be with, who's already with somebody, knowing that it's only going to be physical, it's only going, you're only going to be having the breadcrumbs or be number two. Mm -hmm. And if you are okay with that, well, why is that? Why are you okay with being somebody's number two? Um, I'm just, this is a hypo hypothetical question. I'm not saying it's anything wrong with it. Mm -hmm. But it comes from, again, being... To me, again, it sounds like this avoidant pattern is coming back. It's just coming from the other side this time, you know, being mm. the, the third partner or the third person coming into this, this whatever relationship or whatever. So it's just like avoidance meeting avoidance in a way, you know, if you look at it from like a very over, you know, perspective, looking in very objectively to what is actually going on. It's to me, it sounds like avoidance is meeting avoidance. Yeah, and that's where I said, like, I, I personally do not know many open relationships that work in the long run. That is actually my last point. Do they work? Has, has anyone ever succeeded? <laughs> um, <clears throat> sure, there are, like, in a polygamous relationship where, well, but then it's like one guy, for example, who has, like, three wives or something, but. But there is still a ranking within the women. There's, there's number one wife. Yeah, number two, and number there three, is. You know. And, 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 and even, even if I, like, this could be such a, a personal and emotional topic for someone, or for some people to listen to, if they are in that, right? But there is naturally going to be a ranking, you know? Yeah. Even if you don't want to admit to that, you know, the person who is ranking them, there is. You're going to have a favorite. You're going to have a least favorite one. You can still love them all, right? But you do have a number one in a way, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and this is where I see the flaws of an open relationship and where I do think it's more drawn on, on unresolved issues. Not to say that in a, a monogamous relationship, you don't have issues, right? Because you have many. Of course you do. Of mm. course, right? So... But I feel, yeah, it's another just form of other real, yeah, uh, struggles, other issues of coping with them. I don't think it's a solution because yeah. you're in a, in a way either yeah, number one or number two, but you are not just completely f with someone. No, exactly. It would be so interesting to to have someone else come in and join you know or just have like a whole so, conversation just on yep. this just to get their point of view and and to actually discuss it like really uh, well you know. there is actually uh on youtube it's um i think this channel it's called the end like d and an right. end with a and d but they also just uh they're they just have conversations with one-on-one, -on -one, but also group conversations where I don't know if this is the right channel actually, uh, but I, I can look it up. But either way, I do remember that I watched an episode of some channel where they invited people in a monogamous relationship and people in a polygamous relationship and just threw questions at both of them and where both of the parties answered those questions. Uh, but that was just one conversation rights but i would love to see more but there are things like that actually on youtube okay uh yeah yeah uh and 
yeah, many times you do hear the answer of the ones that we kind of touched upon uh, of the monogamous. Like, yeah, I can't see myself sharing my partner with someone. Mm. And in polygamy, yeah, it's just like love that you want to expand to other people. But yeah. then you don't hear the full context either, I think. So, mm-hmm. and it's important to understand when you want to understand something to hear the full context. Otherwise, you can't understand it, right? So, yeah. I think there's definitely more to it, um, like what we talked about here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's fascinating. It is. And I'm kind of a little 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 bit and i think like bali is a good example where this is quite a more of a common thing open relationships i'm kind of not afraid but kind of i don't know worried maybe for people to to escape their demons through this because it's never you're escaping you're never fixing something Mm. and in the long run i don't think it's gonna play out right (laughs) somebody's gonna get hurt (laughs) of course somebody's gonna get hurt yeah yeah i think so because we are still humans you know yeah and uh yeah yeah Mm. Yeah, and that's where i think the part of jealousy the one that there are so many times trying to avoid is actually the one that they might want to listen to more yeah because yeah. they're trying to avoid it. So maybe that's why they should listen to it more. But I mm. think it's the one that is actually important to feel for them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's all right. my take on this. <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> Moving on. I'm filling up my glass for the last time. <laughs> all right. Let me fill mine up too, so I can ask you the final one that I have here of my questions. Hang on, just would you want to move your microphone a little bit to the side because now it's focusing on that and your face is kind of blurry. All right, good. Yes, not blurry, but it's just like I feel like I'm. You're in the back of your microphone. All right, (laughs) I want to see your face, not that. What do you mean? My microphone is beautiful. Don't you want to just? But so are you. <laughs> I know. I should kind of figure out a better setup for my microphone to kind of kind maybe of come like from here above. From <laughs> but I know it's kind of like in front of me, right? Like yeah, exactly. Could, yeah, what, yeah. What great. about this? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. You- <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> oh no. Uh, no, I agree. Yeah. All right. Um, this is a. Yeah, a personal topic, a personal um, question. Let me just read it a little bit closer right now. (laughs) Uh, So, all right, yeah. And I want to ask this question um, because we both, and I think you know what I'm going to ask, at least after this sentence now that I'm going to say. It's something that we both experienced in life uh, it's something that a lot of people will experience at some point in their life so i think it could be very helpful uh maybe for you and for me to give some kind of some inputs on this so what i want to ask is like what have you learned from losing someone and losing someone in this case i mean your brother right yeah that's the first part of that question. Then I have another one is how do you, but let me first, let me first let you answer that question. Like what have you learned from this experience of uh, yeah, losing your brother? Ooh, what I've learned from it. Ooh. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, that's a big one. You said yeah. it for last, huh? <laughs> oh, well, I've actually, it's a, it's an interesting question because I've asked myself that question a lot. Mm. You know, okay. uh, what is it that I have learned from this, uh, if anything at all? Um, yeah. Because sometimes it feels completely meaningless to have lost somebody. Mm. You know, it doesn't hasn't given me anything. 
other than just complete heartbreak and sorrow and grief and endless endless sleepless nights and sorrow and buckets of tears you know mm. um so it's just mm, when i am have better days and i'm trying to look at i mean the positive i don't i don't want to use the word positive either because it doesn't resonate with me but uh useful uh, probably is a better word and that's a better word yeah. that is what you're asking too so um so i don't know if i can even answer that but what i can tell is that do you feel okay talking about this by the way yeah yeah for sure I don't wanna... it's just it's just very it's a big question right so yeah. it's, it's really it i kind of have to take it uh it's like a process to kind of get to the answer i guess um but i definitely feel it has given me the opportunity to have genuine compassion with somebody else who has lost somebody yep. which which makes me a person they would come to when mm. they have experienced this which is a very nice feeling Mm -hmm. you know, to be able to be there for somebody who really don't have anyone else to go to, to talk to, because a lot of people would avoid talking about this at any cost, uh, especially those who haven't experienced it. Mm. So when you have the experience firsthand, at least you can be a resource for somebody who's just going through this, you know? And I think <clears throat> that is, it's, it's nice in a very ironic way that you can share, you know, you can understand how the process that they're going through, the emotions that are running through their bodies at all, you know, types of, you know, time or, you know, all that stuff. <clears throat> so, you know, I think that's, that's, uh, that has, this is a nice thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, other than that, I really don't, and it's also a little bit maybe about that whole gratitude thing, living in the moment and, and, um, trying to make the most of life. I think, I mean, I've always had that feeling, but after I lost my brother, I definitely got a wake up call, mm. uh, in terms of, all right, life is happening right now, yep. you know? And so, but I've always, you know, had the thought, like if an opportunity came to me, I would always consider it, you know, sometimes, most of the times I would say yes. Uh, but after this, I would definitely, you know, still have that very much in my consciousness in terms of, you know, this is a, an, an opportunity I want to take very often it would be, um, and just going, yeah, just being grateful for it and, and just, you know, because losing somebody gives your life an automatic depth that you haven't, that you didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And that depth is actually valuable. Can you for a second give some context to like when uh, you lost your brother? So, well, so then it's, it's just that because it is so easy to live, go through life and not really reflect on what's important and what gives you meaning and what makes you happy. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people that I know, it sounds really sad when I say it, but it seems like they, they, they just live on the surface. You know, they just kind of go like, woo, 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 you, and they don't really reflect on what's going on behind the curtains or like, or in a, on a deeper level. And if you ever try to bring up something in a conversation that is a little bit uncomfortable, they would basically just scoop it under the carpet or not even talk about it. And this kind of like go back up to the surface because that's where it's more comfortable. But when you have lost somebody, you are forced to not be comfortable. You're forced down on a level that you that's don't true. really want to be, but you are, you have to feel the mm. deepest, the worst, the, the saddest emotions that you can actually feel. Mm. feel them so 
whether or not you want to have more depth in your life or your, your perspective on life, you will automatically get it because you have to, you know, mm -hmm. you pushed down there somewhere, you know, somehow. Um, so, but of course, you know, then people can bounce back up to the surface because they don't want to be down there. Oh. That journey that you were on. Yep. <laughs> uh, once you, while you were in that kind of dark place, I think that will give, uh, give you more fulfillment or give you, give you more joy in a way. Mm -hmm. you know, because, because then you feel, at least for me, then I, when I really feel happy and joyful, I really, really feel it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, I can, I, I really, woof, I well, really, you have myself. something, you have something to compare it to. Yeah. And that's what sometimes a lot of people do not have. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, that must be probably the one thing, one of the few things I can take out of this. I'm going to ask it again. I don't know if you are comfortable or okay with answering it, yeah. but yeah. I asked it like, when did you, like what age were you when you lost your brother? I was 21. 21. Yep. Mm. Yeah. So it's been a couple of years. Yeah. A couple. <laughs> yeah. No, it's been, uh, it's been a few, but it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy, you know? uh what life has been without him because it's mm. you know, something of course that i didn't expect and uh and it has also actually made me realize or discover rather <laughs> the difference between depression and sorrow can because you explain those two, those two things yep. are very very different uh for for instance and i tried to explain this oh, i try explain this to my therapist at one point mm -hmm. because when i first seeked uh, therapy it was a few years after my brother died and everybody all the therapists that i went to not all of them but i only went i went to like two or three they, <laughs> all of them in the world like, <laughs> it was like i've been to like therapy my whole life i haven't uh -huh. but the ones I went to because it didn't work. And I will tell you in a second why it didn't work yeah. because they all, the ones that I didn't work with, they jumped to the conclusion that I was struggling with something with my brother. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then I told him like this, what I'm struggling with right now has nothing to do with my brother. It might be in the mix somewhere, but that is not the main course of why I'm sitting in front of you. you know, okay. why I'm seeking therapy. And they, they, then they were kind of like thrown off a little bit because they had then, you know, some, I don't know how therapists work, but then they seem like they have already programmed uh, what, they, what the, the sessions were going to look like almost, like how the, the, the treatment was going to be because they were basing it on, uh, this has to be something that I'm, I'm working something with my brother. And then when I told them, this is nothing to do with him. And, and I'm pretty sure that it really didn't because... I know how it feels because depression is something that goes on in the head. It feel, I can feel it in my head much more. It's, it's, it's up here. Sorrow is down here in the heart. Mm -hmm. And that is two very different feelings, uh, mental states almost. Oh, totally. I mean, like sorrow is like a, a deep sadness, you know? You yeah. could say it's like the next level of sadness. Yeah. But why do you feel like it didn't have to do anything with your brother? Because what I was seeking therapy for at the time had nothing to do with him because I didn't think about him when I was there because I was, uh, like as my doctor said, lightly depressed. Mm -hmm. Because she had filled in some sort of form that uh, concluded that I was lightly depressed. <clears throat> so I was like, okay, um, you know, in terms of uh, I didn't sleep and I didn't eat and I, you know, right. she picked all these boxes. I don't know what it yeah. was. It didn't feel very, I don't know, it's a very strange way of um, accomplishing, like reaching the conclusion. But well, yeah, <laughs> it's not just only about checking boxes off, but there are 
there are signs, right? There are mm. signs, but it's of course not just alone about checking boxes off. That's true. No, no. But um, no, anyway, so, so, but, so, but the thing is when I finally found a therapist that I wanted to work with, which mm-hmm. was a psychodrama therapist. Psychodrama, yeah. Yeah, it's the most amazing way of therapy. And it was the, absolutely the one that worked for me more than just sitting having a conversation with a, with a normal psychiatrist, yeah, or psychologist. Um, yep. So whenever, whenever we had, when I have the therapy with her, we didn't talk about me losing my brother because I knew that wasn't really the problem. We were talking about my childhood because that was where the shit happened and that was what i was struggling with and that was why i was depressed that i lost my brother was just an extra mm, uh, yeah. you know thing that came on top but that so, I, I was grieving him the bucket was already filling before you lost him too mm. and he was just mm. another drop probably yeah. a big drop right but he was another drop <clears throat> he was a tsunami the in the bucket but the the, the yep. bucket was already definitely full okay yeah yeah. So, so that was interesting. So actually I used him as, you know, as part of, of trying to heal uh, a lot of the trauma that I was going through mm. because what we did was, um, because I almost, I freaked out. I remember specifically one, one session where we talked about something very important to me just before the session was over. Mm. And I almost had some sort of anxiety attack just before I went out the door. And she was like, and I was like, I cannot go back on the street right now because I feel so fragile. I'm going to, I'm going to crash at some point. And she goes like, all right, so sit, go back down, sit down in the chair. And then she had like, okay, so if your brother would, was here, what would you, what would you tell him? Mm-hmm. You know? And then we had like a, a mirror conversation thing where, where she would be my brother. And then, you know, we were like, Yep. I was like having a conversation with him. So instead of going into that whole thing, I miss him so much. I, I then used him as a resource for what I think he would have told me if, mm-hmm. if, if I told him my issues. And then he would then say to me, hey, sister, this is going to be fine. You know, you're just having a whatever breakdown. You know, this is whatever he would say, right? Mm-hmm. So I actually used him as a resource to kind of calm myself down and then being able to, you know, get the anxiety down and then be able to, to go back out into life, you know? Yeah. Uh, this is sort of like the thing, cause many times people, when you're moving through a trauma, they think it's just in your minds alone. Uh, it's one part, but then also the body part, moving through it, uh, which is through the body, right? It's really a thing that you also have to do. Uh, but yes, like sort of like scenarios, like another person playing someone like your brother, for example, hmm. it's really powerful actually to heal or, or to say things that you haven't said, for example, and to move through that or to you or to be able to use that person as a resource, for example. Hmm. Uh, so it's super powerful. Uh, and uh, that's a good way. Because uh, you're using your body and many times it's just the mind and the body, those boats together that you can get over something like a trauma. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So if, yeah. And well, the, the, the question together with that was like, how do you co-op with losing someone Mm. today? Well, I mean, I'm laughing because okay. it's such a hard. <laughs> it's a very it's, hard question. It's and I I am not just. I mean I know what it kind of feels right. Uh, feels yeah. like so yeah. No, but I mean, uh, I have had this question asked to me before, and um, mm-hmm. and uh, I mean. Um, don't also what uh i don't even know how to phrase this um the only i think thing that so when you have lost somebody and it feels horrible and you don't really see the light in the tunnel Mm -hmm. and you think 
that you're never going to laugh again. You think that you're never going to feel joy again, or you're never going to feel anything that has to do with pleasure or anything, you know, when it's really that dark. Yeah. What I can say is, and I, and this goes for, I, I would say 99% of the people that has lost somebody mm-hmm. that time will heal the, the sorrow, you know, it will be better mm. in time. You know, yeah. you just have to give yourself the time to grieve and cry and scream and go to therapy and do all the things that you need to do to get yourself out of the tunnel mm. because there is a light in the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Even though you can't see it and you, you might take you a long time before you see the light in the end of it, but there is a light. And uh, even though you don't believe it, you just have to know that it's there yeah. because it is, it is possible to have a nice, a good life after you've lost somebody, even though, you know, you feel at the moment that it's impossible to, to, to have a life without your partner or whoever it is that you've lost. It yeah. is actually possible. It, the thing is that <clears throat> you still feel all the things that you felt before. Mm-hmm. It's just that you just have a little part of your heart that is, you know, a sorrow. And you will carry that with you all the time. So even though you feel like this enormous amount of joy, you will still do that. But you will still, of course, have a little bit of piece of your heart that is carrying that little grief or that little sorrow and that, you know, that you miss the part the, the person that you have lost, but you can still feel the whole rainbow of experiences and, and emotions on the good side. Yeah. So it just, you will still feel the joy. It just feels a little bit different. That's all. This is like such a common answer. Uh, I think, yeah, like for most when they went through this and lost someone the same, but it's common because it's true and uh, it's hard to realize when you just lost someone. Right. So, but it is true. Uh, but the hard part is giving time, the opportunity to heal it to some degree, but the whole, you know, of having lost someone is always going to be there. It's, you know, it, it's never going to be filled up in a way, right? You're always going to have, you're, you're always going to have lost your brother. You know, you've always going to lost whoever, right? It's always going to be there. Um, so I think if I could just share with you what I, um, it's going to be a little bit similar in some ways. Um, but so first, like what I've learned from losing someone, someone, uh, and that someone is like my dad then is and I, like it is quite similar so it's quite interesting to also let me confirm again like what you've sort of said but and it's not like I would wish someone to lose a person you know like that pain to go through that I would never want to wish that upon anyone but what it did definitely teach me that I do feel sometimes people don't completely get when they haven't lost someone is just the fact that life ends. And I feel like my dad definitely taught me that lesson that, you know, yeah, life is ticking away slowly. You never know when it's going to end. It could be any, any age, could be so random. So just, you know, live life right now as much as you can do what makes you happy and uh, yeah it's can end anytime and that lesson has really helped me uh to do quite a lot of of yeah what i've done in life of like the travels that i've done um and so i'm very happy for that lesson actually uh so i think that's what i what i learned from losing someone so it's kind of like the same what you said of uh, not taking things for granted. Mm. And I think in, in the way of like how I cope with it is to, to kind of truly understand that life is not fair. And, you know, 
everyone goes through hard times. Everyone has some kind of unfairness to them. It's just how life is. Life is just not fair. And maybe it's not helpful for some, but it's helpful for me to just acknowledge that, yeah, life is not fair. It's just how it is. And then to mainly focus on the lesson that it taught me. That is how I am sort of able to cope with it. To just focus on, on what my dad through, through that has taught me, you know, to not take things for granted and to sort of like try to live as much as I can uh, now. That's, yeah, um, how I'm able to cope with it. But again, the hole that it creates, it's there. It's always going to be there. And sort of accepting the fact that it's going to be a part of you now. Mm. And that's not easy. But you learn to deal with it after yeah. a while. You learn to acknowledge that it's a part of you. And that's sort of the thing that I said at first, that life is not fair. You know, you didn't want this, you didn't ask for it, but it is how it is now. Hmm. So <laughs> <laughs> that is my answer to those questions. Yeah. Yeah. But now, just when we were talking about it and talking about what we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. so by you driving yourself, you know, up the wall with, you know, work in terms of that you sometimes overdo it, yep. can this have something to do with it, you think? Um, I don't think so. I mean... I'm not saying it couldn't be a factor in it, but I wouldn't say it's the direct link to it. Okay. I think the direct link to that of like wanting like overworking is more my own more thinking that I should be more. So it's more to do with self-esteem and thinking less of myself and comparing myself and everyone compares himself or herself to someone, right? Even if you subcut like, it's impossible and it's actually quite normal as a human being to compare yourself and to not just settle for less. It's quite a normal behavior. And I even like they did once like psychologists once did like a research or like an experiment on this where they texted, I don't know the exact number of people, but where they texted X amount of people uh, for several months, just, you know, how are you doing? What, oh no, what are you doing right now? And give me a rating from one to 10, how you're feeling. And basically okay. what they came to figure out through this is that everyone is basically a seven. <laughs> everyone is basically feeling not completely happy, happy all the time, but not completely unsatisfied either. But oh. sort of between, you know, wanting to improve and, and kind of feeling good. And it's quite a human behavior to kind of want to be more. And so that thing of comparison is quite a natural human behavior in a way. It's just that right now it's too much, right? Mm. We're doing it too much. But um, so it, 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 like in that way, even if you don't sub like subconsciously compare, compare yourself constantly, you're still doing it. What would it? Uh, yeah, unconsciously, uh, you're still doing that because it's just human to do that. Um, but I think, yeah, the link is not per se my dad's. I think he created some other things, like more like relationship um, issues. But that link of overworking comes more from just self-hatred from in the past. And from just comparing myself to do more, uh, yeah, from people who are doing more and that I'm not doing anything, but I'm watching a Netflix show and that I should be doing more then. So that's more there, I think. Yeah, okay. But again, yeah. I'm not saying he, he wouldn't have played some kind of maybe role in it, but he, I don't think it's the dominating one in it, no. in that particular uh, thing. No. Yeah. All right. So, 
on your list is there anything else or were that the questions no for this uh, session i think it's okay <laughs> i think we could go on for hours more <laughs> i mean we we totally could and yeah. uh we should at some other points <laughs>